Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to my Microsoft Excel full course. This is a five-hour course that's going to cover everything you could ever want to do with Excel. It is applicable to beginners as well as advanced users. And on top of that, there are no ads or sponsorships for the next five hours. I also don't sell additional Excel courses. Everything is in this video. A link to the files used in this video is available in the description on GitHub for free. A table of contents is also available in the description so you can jump to whatever you want to learn about. This took a while to make, so I hope you enjoy it. And I have a lot to do, so let's get into it. All right, so let's get started with Excel. Now, whenever you first open up Excel, you're going to see something that looks like this. And it's very important to understand that the way Excel looks pretty much goes back to 2003. It's, it's, it's very similar. And so pretty much anything, any version in the future will also be very similar. Now, Home is going to really focus in on recent documents with a little bit about templates across the top, while new is really going to focus in on the templates and showing them in a larger format. But we're going to start off very simple. We're just going to open up a blank workbook. Now, if I want this to get bigger, I'm going to type in something like monthly budget. And you probably can't see that. But if I hold down my control key, I can go and zoom in on this. So boom, and now the monthly budget's going to show up bigger. All right, now I'm just gonna go through here in the interface and sort of explain what all the individual pieces are. What we have up here is what is called the quick access toolbar. And you may or may not see it. This part right here is going to show all of the different parts of it. So let's say we want to hide the quick access toolbar, okay? It's not there anymore, and at least you cannot see it. It's very easy to make it appear, however. Just go where it says autosave and right click and say add to quick access to or show quick access toolbar, I mean. All right, and then it'll show up. It might show up down here, and if it does, you can go and also reposition it just by clicking on this little arrow that's down here. Another thing you can see here, I have new, that would be for a new document, and print preview are the two quick access tools that I have, or at least that I would like to use. Um, let's say that I would also like to have the ability to very quickly sort in ascending format. I just click on it, and there it is right there. And then I can go and say, I don't use that all the time, so I want to get rid of it. And there it is. It is gone. All right, so that is just the way the Quick Access Toolbar works. All right, all right, and on to the next thing. This part right here is what we call the ribbon, and you're going to see different tools that are going to be available to you just by clicking on all of these different tabs. I, however, tend to use shortcuts a lot, and I will be using a lot of shortcuts. If I want to come in here and create a new worksheet, I can just come down here to the plus area and click on that. And why don't I just show you some real quick shortcuts that I have found useful. And here they are. So I went and copied and pasted these over from another Excel worksheet. And this is basically all of the different, remember, control and scroll wheel to enlarge them. All right. These are the most common shortcuts that I use. And another thing here, you may notice that these are sort of crammed together. If you just go in between the columns and double click up here, it's going to automatically resize to be able to accommodate all of the space that is required for you to be able to plug all this information inside of here um, and so forth and so on. And you can go and sort these different pieces as you would like. All right. And there I moved that up. Another thing you may be noticing is I have a space inside of here. How did I pull off all that craziness? Well, if you would come in here, let's just go into this cell and let's cut this out. And let's say that I want to go and have this be two lines instead of just simply one. Hold down the Alt key and go inside of here. And then I can paste that inside of there. But I have uh, extra space. So just hold down the alt and you can make that be two lines of text instead of one. 
Now, this is going to, right here, I have all the shortcuts for changing to the different tabs. So I am currently, let's say I wanted to go to the file tab. I just go Alt and F, and it's going to open that up for me. And then you can go and also then hit one of these letters. So you can hit H for home or N for new or O for open or whatever you would like. And it's automatically going to allow you to very quickly go and issue all those commands. I can just hit the arrow to go back where I was. Also, we can just go Alt H. Well, that's home. We can go Alt N and that is the insert. And then you can see these keys. So if you want to get an add on, you would then hit the letters A and S. Bing maps, you could hit A and two and so forth and so on to go and issue all those different commands. So that's what this is in reference to if you want to very quickly change to the different tabs available. Control S is save, of course. Close a workbook. Control W, copy, paste, cut. I assume you know what all those are. And we're going to get into some of these other additional um, different shortcuts as we continue. And uh, because I think it's a lot easier to remember them if you see them in an example. I'm going to go back to my original sheet, though, that I have down here. By the way, if you would like to change the name of one of your sheets, just double click on it. And then you can just say something like budget, which is what we're going to be working on. And now it is called budget. If you would like to copy the budget, you can just hold down control, grab budget and drop it over here. And there you go. You made a copy of the budget. And if you want to delete a sheet, you just right click on it and delete. One thing that is very, 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 very important to know is if you delete a worksheet, you cannot get it back. So if I click delete, I am not going to be able to undo that. So if I'm over in home, we're not going to be able to undo and bring that sheet back. The only way to bring the sheet back is to close the document and without saving and then reopen it. Um, and that is where we're at. Okay. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to go and create a monthly budget and we're going to learn a ton about Excel as we go. I'm going to start off by saying I'm going to look at my projected income. And remember, if I want this to be enlarged so it can accommodate all of that different text, I'm just going to double click there and there it is. What else am I going to do here? Well, I would like to be able to chart dates. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say that I want this to be January, something like that. January. Oops, if I spell January right. And uh, maybe, or maybe let's abbreviate this to January dash 2023. And you can see that what it did there was it actually cut off the 2023 part. We're going to get into how to change the different dates and so forth and so on. Another thing that is extremely important is this is called the formula bar, and we're going to be doing a ton with formulas here. And you're going to see also that it's going to reference whatever the cell name is. And the cells are basically named using their column first. So this would be C and then their row. So you can see that this cell right here is called C3. And that should make a ton of sense to you. Another thing, um, we have different views down here in the very bottom of the screen. We have normal, we have page layout, and then we have page break preview. And basically, the page layout is what is what the printed document is going to look like. So if I just click on that, you can see exactly how that's going to work out. And then you have your additional page break preview. If we click on that, it's going to show you where page breaks would appear during your printing. Another thing down here is your zoom bar. You're going to be able to zoom in and zoom out. But I see really no point in that because I can just hold down control and use my scroll wheel. I guess if you don't have a scroll wheel, then, you know, that's going to help you. Uh, we also have a status bar down here. And it just shows information on your selected data. And also... The main player here is called the workbook. So this is the Excel workbook. Another thing that's important is if we come in here, let's just go uh, control S and we want to save this document and I go and click into my tutorials and Excel tutorial 
and I give this a name. Let's call this Excel Tutorial 1. And this is going to be on GitHub. All of my files, the shortcuts, and all that stuff. And you can just download them for free, of course. This is going to save as an Excel workbook. And you can see all of the other different file formats that we can use here, however. And the extension for an Excel workbook by default is XLSX. But we're just going to save this right now. So if you didn't understand that, XLSX. S X. That is the extension for Excel files. So we're getting into here now our budget example. Let's go in here and let's create a couple more dates. So let's say I also want February 2023. And I'm also going to do March. Let's do March 2023. I'll show you how to mess with these dates. And Excel is smart and it automatically knows this is a date. One thing that's interesting is if you double click on it, it actually will take the first day of that month. And that is how that information is stored. So let's go and we'll throw in some income information. So let's say I have income and then extra income. And then I'm going to do a total for all of those. And I'm just going to plug in some numbers here so you don't have to sit here and watch me go and do this. So if you want to go and paste, basically what I just copied is going to be two rows and three columns worth of data. What you can do is just copy that from another worksheet and paste it and it's automatically going to go in there. And you can see that this is all numbers. The reason why is because it doesn't fit, but we can easily correct that just by double clicking. There we are, there we are, and there we are. And now everything is going to line up properly. Now, this is set as currency, but if you can remember from our shortcuts over here, where did I do it? Uh, formatting. So by default, if I would have just typed those numbers in, it would have shown up as general. So let's go back and let's change them into general. So let's get these and let's say that they are general. This is going to be control, shift, and tilde. See, that is the general look for numbers that you would type in. And if you want to change them back into currency, we just go control, shift, and dollar sign. And now they are shown as currency, which is very useful. Now, what we have here is we have our income and our extra income. Well, I want to get a total for it. How exactly can I do that? Well, before I, I do this, let me kind of explain something else. Have you noticed that all of the numbers are right aligned while the text is left aligned? This is a default thing, and also the dates are going to be right aligned. The reason why is for neatness reasons. If you have your decimals in the same place, it's much easier to read all of your numbers. If you would like to change your alignment for some unknown reason. So let's say you wanted to change these to be right aligned. You could just go Alt and then you're going to say H and then you can go and work with your alignment. And you can see your alignment right here and also the shortcuts for them. So if I wanted to have this be right aligned, I would just go A and R. So A, R. And now they are going to be right aligned. And that looks ugly. So I'm going to change them back. So it's very good whenever you're very first starting off with all of your different commands and such that you really just work on, well, let's go and get these back in their unugly form. So we'll go Alt and H. And then here is my alignment and align left is what I want to do. So I'm going to do AL. All right. It's very important and it's a very quick, easy way to be able to learn your shortcuts pretty quickly is to first just simply learn these, what would this be? Eight. These eight little shortcuts right here. And then you already know, I mean, save and copy and paste, I assume, if you've used any type of a word processor, you know what all those are. So that's really going to jump you really fast because simply just knowing these eight little shortcuts is going to open up all of the different tabs that are going to make it much easier for you to be able to, you know, 
memorize shortcuts. But before I continue, just staring at these dates is really bothering me. So what I want to do is I want to have these be set for saying Jan-2023. So I'm going to just select all those. And you're going to notice that it says custom right here. This is the type that it considers this information that's selected. If I come down here and click on this, it says currency. If I come over here and click on this, it says general. But I am interested in making these be dates. So what happens if I come in and I say that I want these to be dates? Well, it gives me an option where it shows the 1-1-2023. One, one, I don't like that. Then it shows me this big, giant, long date. That's even worse. And then it doesn't really show me anything else. Well, what I can do is I can come down here where it says more number formats and click on this. You can't see that. Whoops. That's not good. Let's go back out of this. Let's go down here and more number formats. Let's see if I can zoom in. Nope, don't work. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on norm, more number formats. And we're going to see here that if we click on date, that it's going to show us a ton of different options that are available to us. And if I go and I scroll through all of these, I'm going to find that I cannot find the exact date that I am looking for. What I want is three did or three characters dash 2023. Why is that not an option? Well, what I can do is I can create my own custom date. I can go in here where it says custom. And then you can see that it's showing, do I want to, I want to have one month, one day and three care, uh, numbers for the year. Well, let's say that I want that to be different. I want that to be three letters for the month. And then I want four numbers for the year, exactly like I had said before. Well, I can just come in here and select this and I can go month, 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 dash, year, 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 year. And now I'm going to be able to do exactly what I want. So month, 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 year, 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 exactly like that. So I'm going to say, okay, and it's going to give me exactly what I want. And that's just one way that you can play around and make custom data types that do exactly what you are looking for. Well, what I want to do right now is I want to find my total income. How do I do that? Well, we are going to create what is called a formula. And a formula is always going to start with an equal sign. As soon as you type that in, everything's ready to rock and roll. So what we want to do is we want to find the total of those two values. Well, what we can simply do is just click on this and then we can say plus and then we can click on this and we hit enter and it automatically goes and gives me the total of those two values. Now I could go and click equals, and click on this and click on that again, or I can just simply come down here and right down here, you're going to see, let me zoom in, make sure you can see it. See that little dot down there? You're going to be able to go and grab this. This is called the auto fill dot. And if I just drag it over with, I just left clicked and dragged, it's automatically going to add all those values and copy that formula over and make predictions on how I want it to change to get all of my new data. But there's more to a budget than just simply income. So let's go and break this down into all of the different other things that I may need to spend money on. So let's say phone and internet. In my country, those are both the same thing normally. Um, I have electricity I got to pay for, gas I have to pay for, water and sewer, and uh, maybe I have repairs, and I have food and supplies. This is not going to be restaurants, just food in the house. Maybe I have a mortgage and other miscellaneous things. And I'm just going to go and copy and paste these over so that you don't have to watch me type them in. So let's go and throw all of these potential expenses in here. What else do we have? Well, we have transportation, and that is going to be things like fuel and maintenance. I don't I don't live anywhere near a bus line, so that's not an option. Um, and then other. And what else might we have? Well, we might have insurance. And that's going to be car, health, home, 
and other. And there we have all of our different potential expenses so far. Now let's go and get some data and copy this and paste this in. Okay, so here is my monthly um, expenses for fuel. If you can guess, I don't drive very much. Um, and uh, let's go and get our different insurance amounts. Health insurance is provided by the company, so I don't have that, thankfully. And But I do have all these other different things. And this is um, not my real budget, but it is um, basically based off of averages. All right. What else would I like to do? Well, I would like to also go and cover entertainment. So entertainment. And what sort of things could we have? Maybe we have streaming costs for things like Netflix. We have music, movies, restaurants, um, and other. Okay. And then we have, maybe we have loans. Thankfully, I don't have any student loans. Whoops, I have to keep this consistent. Let's go and copy this. Now, I could use a formula to make this uppercase, but I'm not going to do that. So let's just do loans. I'll get more into all a whole host of formulas here in a minute. Maybe we have like credit card. Okay. And then we have taxes, which are awesome. And we're going to have federal. And whoops, I don't need to make that uppercase. Federal, state, local, uh, FICA. And then we'll do total taxes. And we'll do all of those calculations. And then after we have all that, we finally have cash that is left after we pay all of our different expenses. All right, so I went and plugged in more of that data so we can get something that's somewhat normal. But what I need to do now is I need to calculate my federal taxes. So up inside of here, I have my total amount of income and I have to pay taxes on that. Again, we're going to use a formula. I'm going to say equal to and B7 is what we're going to be working with. And then I'm going to go and multiply this times a rate. So I'm going to say a percentage is going to be 0 0.08481. Uh, okay. And there is my federal. Now, if I want to copy this over for all my other different income, remember, very easy. Just grab that little dot down there and it automatically calculates it for me. My state taxes are going to be different. So I'm going to just come in and say equal to. You could also say B7 like that and it's automatically going to work. And I can say that this is going to be 0 0.0307 like that. And again, select it, drag it over, automatically calculates it. My local taxes are going to be 1%, I believe. So we can come in and say equal B7 again times and 0.01. You don't have to put the zero in front of that. Grab this and drag it over. And there we have that. And FICA taxes are going to be, uh, again, equal to B7 times, and this is 0.0765. There we are. And grab this and drag it over. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to get the sum of all of these total taxes. Well, I could go in and I could type in B41. I could do this. I could come in and say equal to, and then I could say B41 plus B42 and all that, but there's a quicker way. You can just simply say sum, and then you can go and select all of those and then hit enter, and it's going to automatically calculate that for you. Another thing you could do without typing any of that in, another thing to do also, if you want to get rid of one cell or multiple cells, you just select it and hit the delete key. Not the arrow pointing backwards, but the delete key on your keyboard gets rid of all of it. Another thing you can do is you can just simply click right here and then under formulas, so Alt M, and there it is. And then we can just click on auto sum or we can just click on you. 
and it is going to automatically sum those values for us. Excel is smart enough to know that's what we want to do. And then I can just simply come over here and drag that over there. And there's we'll do a lot more with all of the different formulas as we continue. Remember Alt-H, and that goes back to my home screen. All right, so what would I like to do now? Well, I have all these different expenses, and what I would like to do is go and find out how much cash I have left. Well, if I look at this, I have my total income, which is up here, and that's in B7. And then I want to delete, I want to subtract from that the sum of all of these values, not the total taxes, but the whole way down to this. To do that, I just simply come in, go equal to B7 minus, and I can say sum of, and then I can go in here and select all of those different expenses. So I can go from here the whole way down. I can just type this in down to here and then hit enter. And that is going to give me the money I have left afterwards. And remember, we want to go and copy that calculation. We can just drag it over here and you're going to see the money I have left after all expenses. Now, one thing that is great here is let's say that this, I don't like the way that this is all spread out all over the place. So, you know, I, you can't see what I'm, what I'm doing here. So what I want to do is I can come in and I can actually select all of these columns and rows and cut those out of there and then go up to the top again and paste them in. So I can just paste them right here and it doesn't break anything except it messes up the, the uh, space that's uh, available for all the different pieces here. So we can just go and select that and make sure that they're all wide enough so that you can see everything. And another thing that's interesting is if you click on this, it actually still says B10 through B44, okay? But everything still works. So very important to understand. So what else can we do? So we can move all those around. Oh, I'd like to also go and get my dates here that I messed with and put those inside of there because that's going to help. Another thing that I'd like to do is I would like to figure out the percentage that I am spending on a whole bunch of these different expenses based, you know, what percentage of my income. So let's say I want to come in here and I want to say percentage. And don't worry, I will make everything prettier here soon enough. Percentage of income. And I'm going to go and get my dates once more. And let's paste those like right here. That looks good enough. And then I'm going to list a whole bunch of expenses. And there they are. Um, another thing is, of course, you can go and resize your different columns just by dragging them. And exactly the same thing can be done over here on your rows. All right. So we have all these different expenses. And now I want to calculate exactly what they would be. So what I want to do is I want to go and find out what part of phone and internet is a percentage of my total income. Well, how I would do that is I would say equal to, and then this is going to be B10 and divided by B7. And there it goes and gives me that calculation. And I'd have to do this for all of my other different amounts. So B10 right here divided by uh, the uh, total B7 amount, which is my total income amount. Another thing, well, I can go and just drag this over and get those additional percentages as well. Now let's say that I would like to come in and I would like to figure out what percentage of the total expenses each of these individual pieces make up. So let's call this percentage of expenses like that. And then I'm going to go and copy all of these guys. So let's copy this and let's paste those down inside of here. Where do I want to put them? I want to put them out, give myself some space here inside of here. So I have dates and so forth and so on. So let's throw this down right there. Okay. So we have all those. And then we're going to have the dates again. So let's just copy those and paste those inside of here. Maybe we paste them right here. One of the reasons why I always separate my dates from my numbers. See, notice there's a row here where there's nothing. 
uh, you're going to see there's a very common error in Excel where Excel tries to figure out, um, it, it tries to use the date as a number. And sometimes you don't want to be a, to actually do that. Um, so we have all of those as well. And also I want to use this all as a percentage. I just noticed this, this does not come back as a percentage. So I can just highlight that. And if I do that, remember control shift and the percent sign. And now it's going to change those all into percents, but I don't necessarily like that. I liked it to be a little bit more precise. So of course I can come up here inside of the percentage if I would like and go and click on percent like that. And it's going to go and give me two decimal places of additional accuracy, which I much prefer. I went and copied and pasted in the different expenses for all of these different expenses. And um, I'm also going to show you a formula that would allow you to look data up on your actual worksheet and by name and then automatically transpose the correct numbers in there. But, you know, we have to take steps here. You only do a couple things at a time. All right. What else would I like to have here? I'd like to get a total for all that was spent on each of these. So I'm going to say that I want to go equal to. And we're going to say sum of, and then I'd like to go and I can do an auto sum also. Um, maybe I'll do auto sum. So I'll just select inside of here and then we can just go alt and M and then auto sum. So let's go and do that. Auto sum and L22, N22, L and 22, N22 automatically did it for me. Pretty cool stuff. And then on top of that, I can go and very quickly copy these down just like I did previously and let double click on that to increase the size there and everything just automatically calculates. So cool stuff. Another thing I'd like to do is get a percentage of the total expense for each one of these based on the total amount. So I'm going to call this column percent and then maybe I also want to come in and do another total for each of those columns. So we can come up here and select this and then we can do again, alt and oh, I'm already on it. And we could do the uh, auto sum again. And it went L22 through 34, L22 through 34. Exactly what we want. Calculate that, select this and get all of those different amounts and double click so that we have enough space to show all of our data on the screen at the same time and you can see over a three month period those specific expenses that I went and honed in on. Now what I'd like to do is go and get a percentage of this amount for the total amount that was spent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say and I'm just telling you up front this is going to cause an error but it's very important to actually for me to make errors so that you don't make them. Okay, so what do I want to do here? I want to go and get this amount, which is in 022, and I want to divide it by this amount right here. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to say equal to this amount right here, divided by and this amount right here. Boom. All right, looks good. So what was I complaining about? Well, I'm going to come in here now and I'm going to select this and I'm going to drag this down to calculate all the percentages. Should work, right? Uh oh, why didn't it work? Well, we have, if I select this right here and we zoom in on it, you're going to see it's 023 divided by 036. Why is that a problem? 036 is down here. There's nothing there. So this is a major problem and it's something that we have to fix. This is called what we've been using all along are relative references. Now, if we want to use this value right here every single time for all of our calculations, what we have to do is use what is called an absolute reference. So let's just highlight all these and go and click on your delete key. Remember, there it is. And let's fix this. So how do we turn this into an absolute reference so that every single time we divide by this number right here? Well, we just simply come up inside of our formula and before 
the O, we're going to put a dollar sign. And then after the O, we're going to put a dollar sign. Here, let me zoom in so you can see that. So it's going to be a dollar sign before the O and before the 35. If you do that, it's going to lock it into position with an absolute reference. And if we do the calculation, you're going to see that it's correct. And you're also going to see that if we go and select this and drag, that it is going to get all of our percentages. And then once again, if we want to go and turn these into percents that look a little bit nicer, we just go Control, Shift, and Percent. It's going to show that amount right there. And if we want to see something different, we go Alt and H. And here is our percent sign, and here is our percent sign. And we can go in there and play around with all the other different customs. And there you go. That is how we can calculate the percentage of total expenses based off of the total amount of expense. Now let's talk about some things that can cause problems. Let's say that I have right here January um, 2023. Okay, And I'm just going to leave it like that. That's perfectly fine. And then I have some numbers. So I put 123 and 62. Remember I said I always put a space between my dates right here and my numbers. Well, now you're going to find out why. So let's say that I would like to come in here and do a sum of, of these. And I'm going to do an auto sum. So we're going to go Alt and M to bring that up. And then we're going to do an auto sum and sum. No problem, right? Let's hit that. And we get 185. But then we get this little mark up here which is actually an error so let's click on that and see what it says so if we click on it you're going to see can i zoom in on it and also show it to you uh it doesn't look like it okay here's the error that we have i'll just read it to you so if we click on it it's going to say formula emits adjacent cells what it's thinking is while it does do the calculation properly it also thinks that it should also add the date to these numbers. And that's the reason why you're getting that error. Now, it's very easy. You can just come in and say ignore error and it'll go away. But it, you don't want those all over your worksheets because people will think you made errors in calculation. Pro, you know, it, it's bad. So I just wanted to show you that and also explain why I always put a space between the date. You don't have to do that. You can go in and do a mist and uh, everything will work out perfectly fine for you. All right. Oops, I went and hit the wrong key. Delete. There we go. Another thing to be well aware of is what we call order of operations. I think it makes more sense to do this in as an example. So, oops, I must have hit my, uh, my uh, cap lock. Yes. So, order, order of operations or some people say order of operation either way is fine okay now whenever we are doing our calculations it's very important to understand the concept of how calculations are going to be performed so we have what is basically whenever you're doing mathematical operations you have to uh, first perform all calculations that are inside of parentheses then any exponents would then be calculated, then any multiplication and division, then finally addition and subtraction. And how a lot of people remember this is, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. And this stands for parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, adding, adding and subtracting. And I'm going to show you some examples here of how things can go wrong if you do not understand this concept. So we'll just go in and do some simple calculations. So we'll say something like uh, 3 plus 6 times 2 is equal to, and let's do another one with parentheses, 3 plus 6 and parentheses times 2. If you're not aware of this, it might surprise you that these are going to give you completely different answers. So if we go equals 3 plus 6 times 2, that's going to give us 15. 
And if we go equals and three plus six like this times two, it gives us 18. All right. In the first situation, what it's going to do is it's going to take the six times the two and it's going to give a value of 12, then add three to it. In the second situation, it's going to, because parentheses are precedent over multiplication, it's going to first add these values, then multiply times two. So you may ask, uh, well, what goes on in regards to multiplication and division? So does multiplication supersede division? Actually, in that situation, doesn't matter. So they have equal precedence, and no matter what you do, they are going to work out perfectly fine. So we'll do uh, 12 divided by 6 times uh, 3 divided by 2. And then down at the bottom, we'll do something like 3 divided by 2 times... Um, 12 divided by, uh, what, oops, that's not right. Uh, 12 divided by six. Okay. Like this. All right. So we get those in there and then let's go and perform these calculations. So this is going to be equal to 12 divided by six times three divided by two. And it gives us a value of three. And let's just say we do three divided by two times 12 divided by 6, just to flip it around, and whoops, I forgot to put the equal sign in there, equals like this, and you're going to get 3, so that doesn't really matter, and we can come in with adding and subtracting as well, and let's perform a similar action with addition, so let's say uh, 12 plus 6 minus 3 plus 2, is equal to, and then in your other situation, let's say 2 minus, remember you have to still do the same calculations, otherwise it's not going to work, plus 6, I'm just doing this in a different order, 12 is equal to, and then you can come over here, equal to 12 plus 6 minus 3 plus 2, add those together, and equal to 2 minus 3 plus 6 plus 12, and you see that you get the same answer once again. And that brings us to exponents, which we didn't talk about. Let's say we have 5 times 2 to the power of 2. If you want to do superscript, by the way, what you can do is, let's just say this is going to be 2 like that, and highlight this, and then we go Alt-H like that. Oops, I guess I have to highlight this again. Come up here, click this, and then you can do superscript. If you want to make that look nice, I'm going to zoom in here. See, superscript, and you can do strike through and all these other different things. We'll get more into fonts later on. And there is your superscript that makes it look a little bit nicer. And uh, then we can come in and do to show you that this is going to give you the wrong answer. If we do five times two, and then do the superscript of that. So we'll do this two like this and do our little superscript. There's that and superscript and okay, there it is. Well, in this circumstance, let's go and do the calculation itself. Actually, we'll say equal to and we'll say five. Then we'll come in here and we'll say equal to five times two. And there's a power function. I'll show it to you in a minute. But I, you can also do this for power. So there it goes. And you get 20. Or if you come in and say equal to with parentheses 5 times 2 like this and to the power of 2, that's going to give you a, an incorrect answer or maybe not the answer that you expected. So rundown of order of operations. Um, hopefully it makes more sense to you now. Also, you can get more spaces to accommodate what you're working with here just by hitting this little arrow over here. So that little arrow down there in the bottom of the screen. There, that one right there. Okay, so let's get rid of that. Okay, so what else would we like to do? Maybe I want to give you a rundown of some common functions that you may find useful. So uh, let's just call this uh, functions. Maybe let's move this the whole way over. Don't worry. I'm going to come back to this and make it look pretty here after I cover functions. So we'll say functions like 
this. And let's say that I wanted to find the average that was spent on food. So we'll say something like average spent on food. And let's think of some other ones. Uh, maybe the number of months that are analyzed. Um, the most money spent on food. Uh, the least, oops, least spent on food. Um, let's say that we wanted to find a month that was like, uh, let's say we want to check if um, the amount spent on food was above average in March. Let's figure these out. So let's come in here and do that. Let's give this some space so that we can accommodate all that. Okay, so let's go here so we can fit it in. Well, we can find averages quite easily. So what we're gonna be pulling information from is right here. So we'll go average spent on food. We just simply come in and say equal to average. And then we go and get the numbers that are in here. So we'll say go select all those and then go and calculate it. And you can see the average spent on food. We can also come in and find out how many months we were tracking information for and the function for that is called count and we just simply come down here where is it there it is and select all that and it's going to give us the number of uh, pieces of data the number of data a number of of numbers total from the area that we selected we can also find out the maximum amount equal to max and then go down here and select this again and enter. That is the maximum amount we spent. The least amount is found by saying equal to min like this. And again, just selecting this and hitting enter again. There is the least amount we spent in any one of those months. And that brings us to something a little bit more complicated and a little bit cooler. That is the if function and the way it's going to work is if a condition is true it's going to return the first value and if it's false it's going to return the second value so what we're going to do is we're going to say equal to and if and we were interested in march so that is that's going to be m26 so is the amount we spent in march higher than our average amount spent. So that's going to be, was it N26 or, yeah, N26, right? Yeah, N26. So we'll say N26. And was that greater than, well, the average we spent, which is T3 right here. Well, in that situation, what we want to say is whoops let's i don't mean to do that you put a comma right here if that is true we want to return the value for yes in this cell and otherwise we want to return a value of no and you can see that yes comes back as true what are some other things i'd like to do maybe i'd like to concatenate some of this information just as basic text so we can say spent each month how can we concatenate that information? Well, actually, we can do it in two ways. My preferred way of doing concatenation is with the ampersand sign. So we can say this is going to be food and supplies. So this is L26, and then it's going to be M and N26. So we can say L26, and then you ampersand sign. If we want to put a space between it, we go and put some quotes inside of there. And... M26, and again, throw those inside of here, and like that. And then another one, finally, for uh, N26, like that. And there you can see that it went and printed in, it combined all those different values in one 
place. We can go also and use concatenate. So concatenate, I don't see any reason to do this, but maybe somebody knows. So this is, uh, what is it, L26? We can also come in and say L26, comma, and then put our spaces inside of here. So this would be M26, and then additional spaces, and N26, like that, and you're going to get exactly the same information. Um, let's say that we would also like to come in here and get like a uh, specific credit card payment. And this is a really cool way of looking up information inside your worksheet and having it automatically transpose over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to use something called VLOOKUP. So let's say I want to look for the January credit card payment. There it is. And how I would find it is I would say equal to V lookup. And then what you're going to follow that with is the words that I am looking for. Well, what am I specifically looking for? I'm looking for the word credit card. So I'll just click on that. So there is credit card. That should be transposed over inside of there. I don't know why it's not showing. Okay, there it is, F12. Then I have to provide a, it says here, table array. I'm going to provide the range where these words should be located. But it's very important. This range must start in the column where the word credit card is. I can come in here and I can go and get all of these different pieces right here. Just make sure that credit card is in the first column where you're searching. Okay, so we have that. We got that information set up. That is our range. Then what I'm looking for is the column in the range that I want to be returned. So what is that going to be? Well, I'm looking specifically for January. So I'm looking for this one right here. So this is going to be, sometimes uh, if you're used to working with programming languages and arrays, this is considered to be column zero, not in this situation. This is considered column one, column two, three, and four. So I'm looking for the January credit card information, which is this value right here. So that's going to be in column two. So let's come back over here. And let's work with that. Let's, what else is going on here? There. So I'm zooming in. Maybe that's why I was causing problems. Okay, so I'm looking for column two. That's the January. And then what I want to do finally is if I'm looking for a, an exact match for credit card, I'm going to type in false, otherwise true. Okay, so I'm going to look for an exact match for the words credit card. If I do that, 393.16. And if we come over here and look at it for our credit card, 393.16. So VLOOKUP is going to allow us to come in here and basically search within my worksheet to find information. Now, there is also something called INDEX. And what it does is it returns a value by row and number from an array of values. So let's say if I want money spent in restaurants in January, how could I do that? Well, let's just call this January restaurants like that. And we're going to use index to be able to make this calculation. So to do it, pretty simple actually, we just say equal to index. And then the area where I want to search for that information. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to look. Uh, let's say that I want to start searching from F5 in here. There's restaurants, what we're looking for. And let's search the whole way through. Hmm, let's just search in this box right here. Did I go and type that in? Um, so there we are. Oh, yeah, there's index. So I'm going to search through all of this specifically for restaurants. So there's the information that I'm pulling information from. Then what I'm specifically looking for is I'm looking for the fourth row and the second column. 
This is first column, second column, fourth row. So this is what I want. I want 290, 12. So what do I say? I want the fourth row. Let's come in and grab this. So this is going to be the fourth row, second column, like that. And there I grabbed that information. And that's a way that you can use index and how index is different than VLOOKUP. Another thing, what else can we do? Um, let's say we want the average spent on food. But in this situation, what I'd like to do is use subtotal. Subtotal is a command that has additional commands inside of it. Kind of a little bit complicated. Um, so it's like it, it, it does like multiple calculations instead of just simply one calculation. So um, what I want to do is I want to use subtotal to find the average spent on food. And look at that. It was smart enough to know what I was doing. All right. And is there a way for me to provide this to you? Um, well, let's go over into formulas. And if we come down inside of here. Yes, actually, I think I'm going to do it this way. So let's click inside of here. And let's come up here where it says insert function. Click on that. Okay, so what you're going to see here whenever you do this is it's going to show you a whole bunch of different functions. Uh, it's going to show you the most recent functions, but you can also come in where it says search for a function and search for a function like maybe you don't know what subtotal does. So you'd like to be able to go in and actually figure out what exactly this guy is. So what we're going to do is I am going to come in and I am going to type in subtotal. So if it'll let me. There, whoops, oh, it went away. All right, insert function, and I'm going to type in subtotal. Well, subtotal is actually there. Let's click on it. Okay, so what's interesting here is this is going to provide you with some information on subtotal. Um, it's going to say function number. What is that? Well, underneath it says function number is the number 1 to 11 that specifies the summary function for the subtotal. And you're like, what on earth does that mean? And then you're going to have a reference. You're like, ah, I don't understand any of this. No problem. What you can do is just say help on this function. Click on that. And Microsoft is going to open up a window that is going to explain to you exactly what subtotal is and provide examples. Now, what it is is function number. If you want to find the average, well, you would type in 1 for average, 2 for count, three for count A, I can explain what all of these different things are. Count, you already saw, it just counts the numbers in a selected area. Count A is going to count any value. It's going to numbers, blank spaces, errors, all that stuff. It's going to count everything. Max, you saw, maximum value, minimum value, product. Um, then you have standard deviation, which if you don't know, it's how widely values are dispersed from an average. And this is also standard deviation. The difference, you don't need to worry about this, but if you want to know, the difference between this is, this is assuming that this is a sample of the total population, while this is assuming that this is every piece of information inside of it. Then you have sum, and then you have variance. And variance is just the squared deviation. Don't worry about it. And the difference between these, once again, is this is a sample of the total values, and this is all the values, okay? So that's how subtotal basically works. Let's get rid of this. All right, and this also shows you how to explore a whole plethora of possible different functions you could be working with. But what we said we wanted was average, and that made it shrink. So let's just come in, and our function number, let's just cancel this all together. All right, let's just come in here and let's actually go and do it. So what we're going to do is we're going to say equal to <clears throat> and uh, sub total like that. We want the average. That was the very first number. You can also see that it pops up inside here. Let's see if I can zoom in. Yes, you can see average count, all the different possible values that are available to you. So that's good also to have that. And then what we're going to do, we said we wanted the average that was spent on food. And that is this right here. So we're just going to select all of that and then 
go and calculate it. And you can see it gives us exactly the same value as we previously had it, except we're using subtotal, which has a whole bunch of functions built into it. Um, another thing is modulus. This gives us the remainder of a division. So five and four. And if we want to come in here and find that remainder, we just simply come in and say equal to mod five divided by four. There it is, is one. Um, other functions you might have is our power functions. So if before I was doing the caret symbol, um, let's go five. I was doing this like that. What we can do instead is say equal to and power and five to the power of two it goes and gives us exactly what we thought we would want before. Another thing is, let's say we wanted to find the ceiling. Ceiling works different um, than maybe you may be used to. Let's do like two or something like this. Um, this is going to be equal to. Basically, what ceiling does is it rounds up a specified number of values instead of just rounding up like this is an option. So we can come in and we can say 4.45 and one like that and you get five, but it also has the option that it, you can say continue rounding up if that's something you'd like to do. So it'll go up to six if you would like. Um, floor is kind of similar. So let's say floor and it's gonna round down but it sort of like skips a step on, on rounding down. So if you wanted to round it down two spaces, you'd actually do three in this situation. So equal to floor and 4.45 and three. And you can see it round down again underneath the four. Otherwise, if it was one, it would just round down to the four. Another thing is um, you can go and get the length of different... Let's say we want to get the length of a cell and let's say that it is a, uh, has a string inside of it equal to length and hello world like that. And it'll tell you how many characters are inside of there. And it also works for cells. There's also a whole bunch of different ways of manipulating data and strings and things. So let's say that I say something like, I love you. And then let's do, let's do a couple of them. He eats pizza just for no reason. And uh, the, I'm also going to show you how to do uppercase and lowercase. So we'll do like the dog sleeps and uh, play around with these. Okay. So what we can do is over here, we can replace love with like. So we can just simply go equal to replace and what were the text we want to manipulate. So that's going to be this one. Go in here like this. And then we're going to define the basically the starting number. So that's going to be one, two, and this is going to be three. I want to start where the L begins. So I'll say L. And then the number of spaces that you want to replace. So I'm going to say four. And then what you want to replace it with. And maybe I want to replace it with like. You can see that that changes that quite easily. Um, another thing is you can do sub or use substitute. So equal to substitute like this. And the way substitute works is your first going to put in your text that you want to work with. So there is your text. And then after that, you're going to put in the word you want to replace. So let's say he is what I'm looking to replace and what you want to replace it with, which is going to be she. And then let's say he is in there multiple different times and you want to replace, let's say it's in there five times. You want to replace the first three. Well, you would just put three here, but in this situation, I'm just going to put one and like that. And you can see that that works. And then there's countless other different ways of messing with um, uppercase and lowercase. 
So let's just take this and change it into uppercase and lowercase. So we'll say equal to upper like that and this boy right here. And now it's all uppercase equal to lower and let's get same thing. And also there's something called proper, which is going to capitalize all the letters in the string. So proper like this, like that, and boom. See, all the letters are now capitalized, but also um, letters inside of the words that shouldn't be capitalized are set as lowercase. And I'm going to do some information on dates, and then I think that's a good rundown of the formulas, and then I'm going to come in here and clean up the overall styling on our little budget that we've created right here. So what sort of things would I like to get? Let's say I want to get the system date, which is going to be the date and the time. And I'd also like to get just the date. And maybe I want the day and I want a month and I want just the year. How would I get all of these different things? Well, if you want to get the date, you just have equal to, and you can make these lowercase, by the way, now. And it's going to give you all of that information. Let's say that I'm only interested in the date, not the time, equal to, and this is going to be today. So you can make these lowercase also, and it's just going to give me that. If I want specifically the day from the date, this is going to be equal to, and I'm going to say day is equal to today, and there it's going to be that. And if I want to go and get the month, guess what? I go month and today, and if I want the year, is equal to and year today, and I think that's good. So there's a rundown of a whole host. I don't even know. I think we've done about 25 functions at this point in time. And as we continue, we will cover many, many more. But now what I want to do is come over here and clean up this worksheet because it looks really ugly. All right. So we have our little budget set up here, but it is, to be quite honest, very ugly. Now, there are numerous ways of solving this, and I'm going to show you a bunch of them. One of them you can do is you might be able to go over here and go new and then maybe look up a... Uh, template that has already been created for you. So we have three months, remember? So we got this guy right here. Is this any good? This is basically going to give you like an overview. Here, we can just open it. Here is a template and it does have income, extra income, total monthly income. However, it's basically this, this could work. We could go and change the projected cost and then get rid of all the calculations that are here and change this into January, February, and March. Do the same for entertainment, and we could go that route. So that's one thing that we could do. Um, I'm not going to. But there are countless different templates that are available to you. However, you're going to find that whenever you go and look them up, they normally aren't going to work exactly as you would expect. And very often, if you're set on using a template, then chances are is that you should start with a template and then work your, your data into what you have here. You can see here's a party planner. I mean, there's wonderful, fantastic templates, and definitely check them out. But that is about as far as I'm going to go right now in regards to templates. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to dress this up, make this look nicer. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this into a template. So we're going to go a different way. Now, we are going to play around with different font options that we have. And we're going to play around with different page layouts. And we're going to make it so that this looks pretty good whenever you print it out. Now, let's go into page layout here first. I'm going to go Alt and P. And here is our page layout area. And you can see all of the different shortcuts that popped up inside of there for us to work. And what this is going to do is allow us to change fonts. And also, you're going to be able to go into themes. And you can find the themes up here. Just click on themes. 
And what this is going to do, you can see all of the text. It's in Office by default, but you can see that the fonts are changing as I just put my mouse over top of all of these different themes that we have inside here. I'm probably just going to stay with the basic Office theme, however. One thing that's very beneficial about using themes, however, is whenever you change them, then I'm just going to stick with Office. If we come back over into our home section and such, the theme colors are going to change. And these colors that they have here by default are going to be complementary colors that are going to work very well together. So it's important to understand that if you go and change the theme here in page layout, that it is also going to change the different colors for your text as well as your background. Now I'm gonna come in here first off and um, one thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move my monthly budget just away from this section here. So I'm gonna go and highlight everything. And what we could do here is just simply, if we put our mouse over top of this, this gives us a little crosshair arrows. And I am going to move our worksheet down here a little bit. And I can go back up here and move it like this. So that we have a column as well as a row that is going to separate our overall worksheet. I like that for now. All right, so what are we gonna do? I'm just gonna work through all of these different parts. I'm gonna first off make this bold. So there's monthly budget. I'm gonna set that for bold. I'm gonna come up here and also change the font size. So let's change it to say 22. I'm then going to go in and I'm going to change the background color for this as well. So let's come up here and let's say that I want uh, maybe the second darkest blue inside of our theme here. Or do I want this one? I don't know. Let's go with this one for right now. All right, so that's good, but now you're not going to be able to read monthly budget. So I'm going to change this to white also. And you can also see now that you're not going to be able to read all of the text here because this is going to be cut off. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to merge these cells. So I'm going to select this cell right here, hold down the shift key. I'm going to have to move percentage of income down also. Um, why don't I do that right now before I make this change where I merge the cells? So I'm going to instead... I, you can see I have projected income here and then income underneath of it. And this is sort of flowing into our um, other information. So I don't want it to be based off of that. That's going to shrink. I'm going to take my percentage of income, however, and I'm going to go and have it line up like everything else is lined up here so far. So I'm going to get this and I'm going to cut this out of here and I'm going to paste it right there and I'm going to do the same thing for this so cut so that is control X and control V to paste those into place and I'm just going to double click and remember everything automatically resizes and I'm also going to resize these columns as well to get my information closer together and that's going to be important because I'm going to try to fit all this information all on one printable page and we'll go through that but what I said I wanted to do was first merge these so that we have a line across the top. So I'm going to select all of those. And then what you can do under home is you are going to see merge and center. I'm going to come over here and click on this. And I'm going to say that I want to merge cells. And now it's going to treat all of those cells as just one cell. And you can see that we have our monthly budget all set up inside of there. Also, to save time, if you would like to go and change our cell color, we can just say Alt and H and then H, and that is going to pop up our theme color so that we would be able to very easily go in and maybe change it to this blue instead of this blue. I think, um, which blue do I like better? Let's see. This is all going to be, uh, you know, preference based off of how you see the world. I am actually colorblind, so I see the world quite different than many other people. Um, if you wanted to change the font color, you're going to say Control and Shift and F, and this is going to allow you to change the font color as well as the fonts. And also, you can play with alignment now very easily. 
and what type of font uh, data type you're working with. And you can also change the fill there. So that's another option that's available to you. But for now, I think that that looks pretty good. Another thing that we might want to do is to go and add a border under my title. So to do that, you say Alt and H, and then you're going to say B for border. So border, and you can see all the borders pop up inside of here. Now let's say that I would like to put a border on the bottom. Well, I just hit O for bottom, and that's going to put a, a border on the bottom there for us to play around with. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't really see a border here, okay? So very often what I'm going to want to do instead is create a custom border. So one thing we can do here, um, let's say that we select this, and we could do Control and Shift and F, and that's going to bring this guy up again. We saw it once before. What we're going to be able to do now is go inside of here and decide where we want our borders to be, or maybe we don't want any borders. Or maybe we just want a black bar to go across the bottom here. Well, to do that, you could select this. And you may notice that nothing has changed on our screen. Well, what we have to do is actually click inside of here to say where we want that border to be. And we could also put one up here, put one over here, put one basically anywhere we would want. And the color, you can also choose the colors and all of those things. But I think for now, that's perfectly fine and I can sort of see a slight black border underneath of there, and that's how you create custom borders, and you can play around and change it however you would like. Um, after that, I don't know about you, but all of these dollar signs are starting to get very, very busy. So if we would like to get rid of them, maybe we want a dollar sign at the top, and then the rest of them, we don't want to show dollar signs. Well, very simply, you just select all those, come up here, you can see this little comma, Click on it, and now all of those go away. And also, it's going to replace the zeros with just dashes, which I also really, really like. Going to go in here again and do much the same. However, I think I'm going to leave the dollar amounts in total cash as well as in cash left. So let's come in here and again hit that little comma button. All gone. These are percentages. We don't need to worry about those. And then we can come in here to this amount. These are percentages again. Do I want the totals to have dollar signs? I'm going to say no in this circumstance. Maybe you see the world different. I'm going to come down here and select that and get rid of all of those dollar signs as well. And like I said, I much prefer to have a dash here instead of a zero. I like the fact that that is a default. And then along the way, you're just going to constantly click to resize. And any border that, or any column you want resized, you click on the dash that is after that column's letter to automatically resize if you didn't notice that that's what I was doing. Another thing I'd like to do is I see here in the percentages that I have two um, decimal values after that. Well, maybe I only want one. You can come up here and you can say decrease decimal and it will decrease the decimal amounts for you. And we're gonna do the same over here for these percentages. And of course, if you hit this button, that's gonna increase the number of decimals. All right, so we're slowly cleaning up what we have here. Now what I wanna do is come in here and also add blue bars in this area. And another thing I'm gonna do is, in hindsight, I've decided that I prefer to have my dates down here on this same line as this mini title that we have here. So I'm gonna cut that out of there, paste that there, do the same for all of these other different dates that we have. So let's just paste those into place so that they look a little bit nicer. Cut them, and we might get some errors in our calculations, that's fine. Cut those out of there, paste those down inside of there. Okay, and then I'm also going to select everything that I, yep, see we have errors here, no problem. And I'm just going to drag this up and place those inside of there. Again, to get rid of these errors, it's an error that is being caused because Microsoft Excel believes that we want to add the numeric date to this row of data. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to select all of those, come over here, and I'm going to say that I want to ignore that error. I'm also going to show you how to go and um, whenever we turn this into a template, 
all these formulas that we use to make calculations, if we don't have numbers over here, which with a template, we wouldn't put in these numbers, it's going to show errors all over the place. And I'm going to show you how to make those errors go away. Just thinking about what is coming. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to go into this area and make a couple style changes. So just select this. And what am I going to do here? Well, um, we can remember our, our shortcut we have, which is control shift and F So control shift F and I am going to probably come in and increase the font size to this to say 14 points. I'm also going to make this bold and I'm also going to change my fill. Well, I'm going to change my color on these to white. And I'm also going to come in and give it the same fill color. And I'm going to click on OK. And look at that. Starting to look a little bit better. Also noticed that I now do not like the fact that there's two rows of difference inside of here. So I'm just going to come up here and drag that up a little bit. Now I could go in and also style all of the other different columns one by one. That's not very fun. So what I would prefer to do is just come in here and select uh, where I just made my change. And then what I'm going to do is right here, you're going to see Format Painter. I'm going to double click on that. And what's awesome now is I can just simply come in and color all of these rows just by dragging. And it's automatically going to copy all of that formatting. This is going to save you an immense amount of time. So let's just go in there and do that with all those. I don't think I want to do anything with cash left. Let's go and change this, however. Whoop. And that uh, date you may see also messed up. So we have to change those back into dates. And all of that's looking better. We just hit escape to stop doing that. And then I want these to be known as dates. Let's see on a whim. These came out good. So maybe we can just copy that over onto there. So I'm going to select that format painter again and then go and click on this. And it looked like it may have worked and it did. So great stuff. So let's just go and copy over the formatting for that as well. All right. Good stuff. And then after I do that, hit escape. And then we're going to be able to see that the dates are exactly the way that we want them to be. So let's just... Go and open all of those up so that they look really nice. Now, that is one very straightforward way of making all these changes. But let's say I want to make it a little bit easier by actually creating a style that I can save up here in my style section that is specific to that. So I know I just went and did all that work, but I'm going to show you something else neat here. So I'm going to come in and I'm also going to show you how to eliminate the problem with um, going and having to come in here and change the data type for the dates and all that. So let's get rid of all this stuff. Um, let's get rid of all of it. Okay, so we got all that. One thing I prefer not to get rid of is moving this. So let's drag this up here, put that into place. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over here where it says styles and I'm gonna click right here where it says more styles. Okay, and then down here, I'm going to say that I want to create a new cell style. Now, inside of here, I'm going to define all the things I want to do. I have to give it a name first. Let's say that I'm mainly styling dates, so I'm just going to call this date style just for the heck of it. It's only going to be a style that shows up in this specific Microsoft Excel file. It's not going to be available everywhere, so you don't need to really worry that much about the name. One thing that I would like to not do, however, is change the data type whenever I apply these styles. Well, it's very simple to do that. All we do is uncheck number, and then it's no longer going to go and try to change the style or the uh, data type for the column or the row that we are manipulating. So after this, I'm going to click on uh, format like this. And I'm going to define all the things that I want. So I said that I wanted it to have a fill that was going to be the second darkest of the blues. And I also, under fonts, I said that I wanted this to be bold. 
So let's make it bold. I said that I want this to be 12 points, I believe. I said I want my color of the text to be white. And I believe that that is all I changed for that. So let's click on OK. And then we can click on OK again. And now you can see date style shows up right inside of there. Now what is really cool is I can come in. I'm going to hold down shift, select these, and then I'm going to hold down control and I'm going to select drag and select all of these other uh, columns in this row like this. So I'm holding down control. That's all I'm doing. Do this, do that, and I'm not going to do anything here. I'm going to come over and I'm going to have this go the whole way over and have this go the whole way over as well. And I'm going to hit date style and look at that changed everything, but it also didn't mess up my dates. So that's good. My date data types. All right. So it's looking better and better as we proceed. But what do you do in the circumstance in which you've created this date style, but then you decided that you want to change the date style? Well, we just in home and then under styles again, we're going to click on the more tag that we have right over here and then we're going to say that we want to modify our cells and how we do that is just go to date style right click on it and click on modify all right so this is good and what we want to do is just click on format like we did before however we're going to say that we want to add a border to the bottom so let's just click here click here and click on ok and then click on ok again and it's automatically going to add a border to everything that uses the style called date style. Now I'd like to come in and also go and add a little bit of an accent to these different rows. So again, I'm going to go shift with this, but then I'm going to hold down control and I'm going to highlight every other row inside of here like this and then like this. And of course you can do it in whichever way you would like. And there we are. So it just takes a minute. I could also create a custom style for this, but I'm not going to in this circumstance. And like that, maybe for this one, I'm going to go and actually have this be a different color. Let's go and select these. I'm actually going to also put some more data inside of here, mainly just to shore up the overall look of this. So let's go get all of these and just highlight them so that they have a little bit of an accent color to them. Like I said, what looks good to me might not look good to you, but I'm giving you all of the skills required to be able to make your design look exactly the way you want it to look, which is always our major goal. Now we can come up inside of our styles, click on more like this, and then say I want to put a 20% blue accent to all of those. So let's do that. It looks bad because it was selected, but now it looks perfectly fine. Now let's come in and I said that I wanted to put some more information inside of here. Maybe I want to say something like average uh, percent. Of course, we learned about the average function, so we're going to say average like this and highlight all of these and hit enter and now it gives us this now we can of course go here and very quickly populate all of these columns just by dragging pretty awesome stuff all right so that's looking better how, do, how come it didn't do this well it doesn't matter because we know about the format painter so let's go select this and then let's just go in and change those However, it is changing those columns, and I don't like that. So let's go in, da, 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 da. Um, escape once again. Let's go and highlight all of these. And then this is a percentage, but it's not the type of percentage that I'm looking for. Let's go like this. And now everything's looking good, except I don't want that extra decimal space. All right, so everything is slowly cleaning itself up. Another thing I'd like to do is in the cache left area, let's maybe go in and highlight this and make this a slightly different color. Same thing we're going to do for total. We're 
going to come in and we're going to go in like here and let's go and add a slight accent color to that just so we can see that a little bit better. You can see these formulas messed up again. Let's come in and let's say that we want to ignore the error. All right, slowly but surely getting nicer. Another thing we might want to do here is format conditionally. And on top of that, have Excel do the formatting for us. So let's say that we are interested in any expenses we have that are going to have a percentage of income over, say, 2.75%. And we want those to be accentuated in some way. Well, we could come in and we can highlight all of these and do what we call conditional formatting. Conditional formatting is right here. So we're going to come up here, click on that. And we're going to come down here where it says highlight cells rules. And we're going to say specifically that we want to highlight if a value is greater than a certain value. So we're going to come in here like this. And we're going to say that we are interested in something that would be something like 0 0.0275 uh, or higher. And it's saying that it's going to have a light red fill with a dark red text. And let's click on OK. And let's see what that looks like. All right. That doesn't look too bad. Um, of course, maybe we would like to come in here and change the way that looks. To do that, we would just go conditional formatting again, like this, and then manage rules. And it's going to say current selection. We don't have anything selected. So we're just going to say worksheet. And you can see here is the styling that we specifically had. And we can just go and double click on it. And we can change what it's going to look like. So maybe we would prefer, it, again, this is 100% up to whatever you're looking to do. But maybe I want to come in here and I want to change this to uh, like a yellow or something. All right, so maybe we want our font to be black. And we want it to be bold. And we want our fill to be some sort of yellow color or something like that. I don't know. I'm just selecting things randomly. And then we can hit OK. And then we can hit OK. And now you can see how those are highlighted instead. Maybe we also want to come in here and track how much money on average we have left every single month. And this is something important to us. So we could say something like average and cash left and come in here and then we can easily calculate that with just average like this highlight all of these different values we have here and hit enter and that's going to show us how much money we have to work with another thing that we can play around with here is um maybe we want to make this bold um i'm just going to hit control b shortcut maybe we want to make this bold Control B, and maybe we want to make this bold. Let's just highlight all of them just in case. And um, why didn't it work? Let's go select this. Control B. There it is. I don't know why it didn't work the first time. And then on top of that, let's maybe move this up a little bit. And we're, you know, slowly but surely making this look a little bit better. Another thing we can mess around with here are different shapes. And we're going to be able to find these under Insert. So you could come in here and you could add photographs. Here, I'll just show you. So we could say from this device, I'm just going to use stock images. Maybe we want to take uh, some blueberries and throw it on our budget calendar. I don't know. Um, maybe something like money would make more sense. I honestly never use images like this. I think it junks up our overall design. But you can see here, maybe they work for you. I can't believe there's not a single money illustration in the whole thing. Let's just get rid of that just so we can see the type of illustrations that are built inside of here. And you can see we can get things that are specific to science and natures and birthday parties. And I think this is more for very creative people rather than just pure number crunchers. But you can see there's some really nice designs inside of here. And maybe you might be able to do something with those. We also have different shapes that we can work with. Like let's maybe say I want to put emphasis on how much cash I have left. That's kind of interesting. So um, just go and click on that. We can come in here and easily resize this. And maybe we want to drag this and throw this right here to show the importance of how much cash we're working with. And of course, you can grab this 
spin this around however you would like. I'm just going to leave it right there. But you can see that there are a whole host of different odd shapes and arrows and so forth and so on that we can play around with inside of here. We also have icons. So we can click on icons and uh, let's say that just for the heck of it, I love cash. Is there a cash thing here I'd like to use? There, maybe this one. All right. So let's select that and let's say insert. And here we have this money that we have here. Well, what I'd like to do instead is I'd like to maybe move it up here and just put it in a corner. So let's go and shrink this down. And I'm not holding shift keys or anything. It's automatically shrinking it to the right amount. And uh, let's just put this in here as an accent. This is something that I normally wouldn't do, but I'm just doing it just to show you some different things. You can use your arrow keys then to properly position it. And it looks really bad being black like that. So you can go graphics fills like this and change it to white. And now it's white. That looks kind of okay. All right, so some different things you can mess with. Um, we can all, we're going to get more into tables and such as we go. There's also 3D models, so there's a whole bunch of different 3D models you can play around with and throw inside of your uh, worksheet if you would like to try those out as well. Another thing that's very useful is to be able to work with charts. So let's come over here, and what I want to do is I want to select the percentages for my different expenses. So I have all of these guys, and you're going to use different types of charts depending upon the different data. As you're going to see, pie charts are largely used for just one column worth of data. But whenever you're working with bar charts, you're going to be able to do all sorts of other different things. So we have all of those selected, and let's say we want to turn this into a bar chart. Well, there's a whole bunch of different bar charts that we can play around with. Maybe let's say we want to try this one. Okay, so here is a bar chart, and we can come over here and select this. One thing that's neat is I can go in here and select this part and say equal to, and then I can come over and click on budget monthly, and it is going to give me whatever the, is over here in the text is automatically going to show up here inside of my bar chart. And maybe I want to come in and change the different bar chart. Maybe I don't like the way this bar chart works. Well, what I'm going to be able to do is I can just select this. And if I highlight this, you're going to see this right here says chart elements. This is going to allow us to add or remove chart elements. Then you have chart styles. That's going to allow for editing of the styling of the chart. And then filters is going to determine what data is shown inside of my chart. I can also highlight this guy right here, and we can make other different changes to the overall way that the chart looks. How we do that is go to chart design. Whoops, chart design. And we can go and say we want this to look a different way. So we can try this one or this one. Or maybe we decide that we just don't like any of these. Well, that's definitely a mess. And uh, we want to work with a totally different chart. Now, in situations which we have lots of columns like this, this type of bar chart doesn't really work all so well. So let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of it. Why won't it go away? Go away, bar chart. I decided I don't like you. There it goes. I got rid of it. All right. So let's use a different bar chart. So let's go and highlight all these again. And let's go and create another chart. So we're going to go insert, and maybe a 3D column is going to work better for us. And uh, why didn't it give me what I was looking for? Let's go and play around with this a little bit more. Let's get rid of that. Oh, I know why it's not. I know why it's not working. Uh, don't select total. That's why. And get rid of that. Let's just come in here and select this part. There we are. And uh, insert and this like this. And I think this is going to work out better. So let's so highlight that. And this is looking a little bit better than what we had before. So you can just play around with all of those different options that you have inside of there. Another thing that's an interesting concept to play around with is to have Excel recommend the chart. So again, under insert, we can go recommended charts like this. 
and it's going to show us a whole bunch of different charts. Or we could say all charts. Maybe we want to see what all these different charts look like. Oh, look at this one. This actually looks like what I want. I really like the way that works. So it has all of the different parts stacked inside of here, which is kind of interesting. Um, actually, and then looking at that, I'm going to get just this part through this part. Click on recommended charts again. And you can see the different charts that they have here. They recommend, but I like all charts here a little bit better. Um, this is a three. Ooh, this one looks nice. And this is showing me how much money I'm spending each month on all of the different amounts. And that's interesting. Also, I think it's, uh, I don't like that. See, it's totally up to you, you know, like whatever you're looking for in your type of chart. But this one looks really kind of interesting. But you can see there's a whole host of different pie charts would not work in this circumstance. Um, just really neat. I mean, it just never, never, never ends. So I kind of like this one and I kind of like that one. And I'm going to say, okay, for that. And again, remember, oops, accidentally drug my title out of here. Let's go and select that and have that be equal to, and come over here and select the monthly budget. Oh, I grabbed the wrong part. Let's come in here and, uh, oh, wait a minute. No, I think it'll work. Oh, didn't work. Okay, well, boom. let's just try that again. So let's go undo and let's go and drag this over here. Select our chart title, click on equal to and click on monthly budget and then hit enter. There it goes. And there we got it inside of there. And then of course you're going to be able to put this wherever you would like to put it. So let's put it right here. Maybe we want to resize it because we think it looks better bigger, which it kind of does a little bit. That's interesting. And like I said before, with this selected, we can go to chart design and look at the different designs that are available to us and select through those to see what we prefer overall in our chart. Hmm. Not loving really any of those. So of course we're going to be able to go back and maybe we do some undo on these different things. Chart design, click on more, figure out what we're looking for here. Hmm. Interesting. Um, let's go in. Not really loving any of those. Maybe we just want to delete this and start over again. That's perfectly fine. So let's just delete it. Select these, select these, go in and we click on insert recommended chart, all charts, columns. We decided we would like this one. Let's select that and let's just go. Okay. Select this boy right here. Go equals go over, select our title for our worksheet and hit enter. That's monthly budget. And we're just playing around here until we get something that looks like something that we're interested in. Okay. I like this. Let's drag it down here right like that and then we're going to export it to another page now whenever we're looking at this we might also see that there's kind of little parts inside of this bar chart that are just a little fraction and maybe they're distracting more than they're adding to what we're trying to analyze which is to try to save money on our monthly overall budget or better yet, as we're analyzing this, we notice that maybe we want to include percentage of expenses in the dates. So let's do that. Just delete it. That's perfectly fine. So let's come in, select this. Again, go in, select all these different parts. This is all playing around, and this is kind of what the design process is all about. So let's go columns, da 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 da, da like this, click that. Now we have February, March inside of there. Again, let's go in and change our tight chart title equal to change it to whatever the name of our worksheet is like that. And now it's starting to look a little bit more useful. So let's drag this, bring this over here, drag this down and slowly but surely get something that looks a little bit more useful. Now, like I said, maybe there's parts of the charts that you want to get rid of. Like, let's say you wanted to just get rid of February. How can you go and do that? Well, what we could do is we can right click on our access that we have down inside of here 
And then what we can do is we can go and get rid of some different things. So let's say we want to format our access and we want to change what is being shown on our screen. Now let's say that we would like to change the data that shows up inside of here, like we said before. Very simple, just click on filter. And let's, we, you can see here as we are moving, telephone is pretty flat, electricity we need, we have gasoline. Maybe we want to just focus in on the things that we have control over. So we need a phone, we, so let's get rid of that. We need electricity, we need gas, we need water, sewer. Uh, maybe we want to focus on food and supplies. Maybe that's something we can change. Fuel is kind of out of our control. Car insurance is out of our control. Um, maybe we will leave streaming on there. And uh, maybe move. Yeah, let's just let's just do all those different things. Okay. So let's say that we want to do that, and we click on apply. Now it's only going to show just those individual things instead of all of those in all of those different parts. And we can see also that the chart is interactive. Whenever we click on it, it's going to highlight over here exactly what we're clicking on. So maybe to control my budget, I decide that I don't want to spend money on movies. And also I can say, well, this is a large percentage of my overall expense. What is that? Food and supplies. Well, maybe I need to calm down on that. And then the only thing left afterwards is restaurants. You can also see that restaurants are making up, even though I only go to restaurants maybe three times a week, that's making up a large percentage of my food. And uh, maybe I want to cut restaurants down to zero if I really want to, you know, fix my overall budget. Just some things we can do with the different charts. Another thing you're probably going to want to do with your charts is you're probably going to want to move them. So to do that, you're going to want to select your chart and then you're going to want to go into chart design and then you're going to click on move chart and you can move it to a new sheet or you can do all sorts of other different things. I'm going to say that I want it to be a new sheet and I'm just going to call this bar chart. So bar chart like that. And I'm going to say, OK, and you're going to see that it creates a brand new sheet that is just the bar chart, nothing else. And you can also see that it's been removed here. Another thing you can do is we can work with pie charts. Now, there's other charts inside of here. You can play around with all those, of course, as well. But with pie charts, you're only going to work with a single column of data. Any more than that, and it's just not going to look good. So what I want to do is I want to come in here and just select this row of data and then go and say that I want to create a pie chart for it. Let's just make a simple 2D pie chart, and you can see exactly what that looks like. So here that is, and we can go and do our obligatory part here where we go and select the pie chart name, and boom, and equal to, and whatever our budget is, make sure to click on the right column. It's actually, well, actually these are merged, so it doesn't matter. Hit enter, and now it says monthly budget. And of course, you can also come in here and change the styling on this guy right here. So we can go into font and maybe we want this to be bold or something like that. Maybe we want to increase the size of it. Maybe let's take it up to uh, 16 instead and font style. Let's make it bold and click on OK. And now you can see that's a little bit more legible than what we had before. And then, of course, we can come in and filter out those things that we don't want to be included inside of there as well. So get rid of all these different things and click on apply. And there you can see a more interactive, useful type of pie chart. Again, you can select it, go into chart design, move chart, and change this to new sheet and call this pie instead and click on OK. And now we have our pie chart over here all by itself. All right, all good, very useful things. Now, another thing you don't want to do, like our uh, sheet here is looking pretty good. But what we would like to do is if it doesn't look good printing, well, then it doesn't look good at all, does it now? So what we're going to say is we're going to say that we want to print this. And also, we probably also want to say that we want to save this and save file and print. And let's see what it looks like. Okay, so this is just a portrait. That's bad. There's all kinds of different settings inside of here. 
So we could first off start here and see if just messing around with this is going to fit everything. This doesn't look very good. We're missing a whole entire column of information. This isn't bad. Um, if we go to page two, we could see there is our percentages. But let's say we want to get all of this on one page. Can we do it just by messing around here? Well, we could do something like making the margins more narrow. Does that fix anything? Um, a little bit. Um, what else can we do? Well, we could go in and actually edit the sheet. Um, also, there's scaling, but we'll get back into scaling. So we go inside of here and we notice, okay, we can shrink this down and this does not cause any problems. Let's shrink, you know, like maybe the boss comes in and says, I want all of these to, to line up really, really tight. All right. What else can we do here? Not much. Another thing is we can come down here where it says page layout, click on that, and we can see exactly how these are all laying out. We could also come over here and actually change where the um, page cutoff is and move that around. So if we move that over there and then we go to print, let's say file and print, we can look and see, hey, look at that. Everything is starting to really fit all on one page and look pretty sharp. Another thing we could do is, let's say we don't want to change where that line is. So we can come in and uh, control, let's zoom in on this a little bit. Um, can I drag that over? No, no, that's not working. Um, let's see if I can undo it. Mm. Anyway, what we could do, we basically fixed our problem. Um, but we could come in also and shrink it. So we could say print and everything is on the page all at one time. It looks good. We could also scale it. So we could come down here. You could try fit a sheet on one page. See if that fixes it. It might. It might not. Custom scaling. And then we could also go in and play around with all of those individual different parts that we have available to us here. Okay. Change our paper source and so forth. Um, what else would we do? Adjust to, this is set at 78%. What's it look like if it's at 100%? It automatically scaled that. That's how it fit everything. Now you can see it doesn't fit. And you can see that messing around with mood, moving where the page was going to be cut off, actually that's what it did. It changed the scaling inside of here. And if we put this back at 78% and Excel calculated that for us, you're going to see that now everything fits rather perfectly. Okay, so we have all this set up. Everything is looking really nice. But something that we might want to do is actually turn this into a template like we saw before so that we can use our custom template whenever we want to use it. Well, to do that, what we're going to want to do is go down here on the for your sheet and right click on it. And then you're going to say move or copy. And what we want to do is we want to create a brand new book. And so we're going to say to book and we're going to say new book and create a copy. We do not want to delete it or anything like that. And then we're going to say, OK, and this new one is going to actually be you can see it right here. We're going to save this as a template. So we're going to go file and save as and we're going to save it in a specific place and i am going to call this um something like three budget template or something like that and we're going to save this as a template file so this is going to be an excel template like that and three month budget three budget template fine okay so now we have it in here only problem is, is we have to come in and we have to fix it so that we get rid of everything that isn't a calculation. How do we do that? Well, we're just going to go in and we're going to delete them. So I'm going to go shift like that and then I'm going to hold down control and get rid of everything else. So let's get rid of all of this stuff, all of that, all of this, all of that. Streaming, yes. Let's get rid of all of that. And credit card, yes. Maybe when we, these are all calculations. So we're going to keep those the same. Cash left, that's going to be the same. Average cash left, also the same. 
And these are also all going to be calculations as well. We're going to notice that we kind of messed up. So what we have here, these are actually not tied to those, but let's go and let's delete all of them. So we'll go delete like that. And you're going to notice this is still here. See, that's not good. So what we want to do instead is go and delete all of these. And see, whenever you're doing templates, that's whenever you start to just figure out, uh-oh, I made all kinds of mistakes. So we're going to so equal to phone internet, and that's going to be equal to this cell right here. And then we're going to go and highlight it, drag it over, and now it's going to work much better. And then we're going to do the same for all of these other ones. So let's go and select all of those. Hit the delete key, remember, not the backspace key. And this is going to be equal to and electricity, whatever they have in there for electricity. And go and select this, drag this over, um, go into gas. That's going to be equal to whatever their gas amount is. And highlight this as well. Drag this over. Whoops, didn't drag right. Get down here. Drag that over there. Water and sewer equal to whatever that is and um, maybe let's just do this for all of them so we'll say food and supplies that's this and fuel equal to and there's the fuel column and car insurance equal to there's car and home insurance and that is streaming is up here and oops that came back as a dollar sign that means that the data type is wrong um we'll say music equal to this and movies also that and restaurants is going to be equal to whatever is in restaurants and also I don't, oh that's credit card that's separate Okay, and then we'll go and drag all these over so that it fills those in automatically. Let's figure out what's going on with this data type that it is showing up the way that it is showing up. And this here. And that. And what is these data types? So let's just go and format cell and have this be number. And then these are supposed to be, what do we have them set for? Accounting or currency? It's always better to just go find out. So let's go into this instead, format cells. You can see all these errors. I'm going to make them all go away. Don't worry about that. Accounting, decimal places too. Okay. So I'm going to do that for this also. So highlight this and format and accounting, decimal places too. No symbol. Click on OK. That looks good. And now it went away. Good. Drag this over here. Drag this over here. And drag this right here. All right. So we have all those set up, and they're more than likely in the right type of format. Also, wait a minute. This one isn't. So let's go format cells. Again, accounting, decimal places too. And we decided for that one, we wanted the dollar sign to show up at the top of the column. Let's change that to that number and I guess that's fine for now and uh, what else or maybe we don't like that I don't like it let's go and <laughs> format it and we'll say symbol and none because I don't like the way that looks for our template if our user wants to use our template and then decides they want dollar signs that's perfectly fine let them do what they wish to do all right now we have this problem here where we have all of these errors well, what we can do is we can use something called if error and make them all go away. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that we want to highlight all of those. Then you're going to hit F5 on your keyboard. And then you're going to click the special button right here. And we want to get rid of that. So we want to specifically check formulas, right, like that. And we're going to sit or click on OK. All right, now what we do is up inside of this area, we fix that problem by using something called if error. So it's pretty easy to do. 
we're just simply going to go up inside of here and we're going to type in why doesn't it let me go in there there it is we'll say if there is an error when we perform this calculation what we prefer to do is instead of putting that nasty looking error we're just going to put a dash inside of there and then you're going to hold control and enter and it makes them all go away and now you no longer have any errors and now you have to do that for all of these i don't think you can do multiple columns at once so we're just going to do it the way that we're doing it like like now so select all of them hit f5 like that click on special click on formulas click on okay and then we're going to go in and do the same thing so we're going to say if error when performing this calculation instead just put a dash inside of there instead of that nasty error. Very important, control enter. And then we're gonna do that again for this part right here. So again, we select everything in the column, F5, special, formulas, okay. And then if error, I could copy and paste if error, but I didn't, so why do it now? So let's go like this, like that, control enter. And then again for this calculation right here. And uh, yeah, so F5 special. If you're doing this multiple times, it should be ingrained in your brain. Click on OK. And you can also do it whenever there's a function. If error, like that, go to the end, dash, boom, boom and control enter and you have all of those why is this showing up as values um this should not show up as values so let's again come in and do the same for this part right here so this is going to be all selected and sometimes there's residual things that just hang around for some unknown reason we're going to get rid of them so we'll say special formulas okay and then if error if error get that there those are those calculations boom boom control enter and now they all zeroed out and this also should not be showing like this maybe we're going to say uh we would have put our error message inside of there also so with that, oops, 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 oops. There's this, that's that, and that is that. Clearly not what we thought. Select that again. Let's just go and get rid of this and get rid of all of these. So there we go. And select, and there we are. And now we have a really nice template that we're going to be able to use anytime we would like and we can just go and save it so we can just come over here and save and it is pretty awesome and now that we have that saved as an excel template it's actually going to show up as one of our template options so we say file and new and where is it here is our three month budget template that is specific to us three month budget template and we're going to be able to use that as much as we would like all right so a whole bunch of different things on designs and up next i'm going to start playing around with sorting and a whole bunch more all right so now we're going to learn about sorting and filtering and a whole bunch of other different things but let's get some new data because this is kind of getting a little boring um let's come in here first and let's go to our data tab and i'm going to show you how to import csv files it's very simple just go over here where it says get and transform data and we're going to say from text csv click on that and you have to find your documents and right here i have uh computer sales let's do that one okay so we got computer sales and there you can see all of them it says that they are delimited with commas and it gives you an overview of exactly what that is going to look like for you. And then we're going to click on load. 
and you can see that it goes and places all of them directly inside of there. One thing you might want to do is when it comes to auto fitting, because nothing here is fit properly, if you just click on home and then you go to format and you go auto fit column width, it's going to do that for you. Well, I guess it's already auto fit, but whatever. That's uh, It looked a little cramped, but I guess it is already auto fit. Um, another thing, uh, let's say if you wanted to see a list of all your sheets, because we're getting more and more sheets down here, you could come down here, there's a little arrow, and you can just right click on it, and it's gonna show you all your sheets. You'd be able to jump to those really quickly. Let's just cancel out of that right now. Another thing you might wanna do is, let's say we wanted to add another row in here for some reason. You could just come in, select one of the rows where you wanted to add something, and just go Control, Shift, and Plus, and you can just place another row directly in on top of that. And this kind of brings us to uh, another thing. You could add more rows just by coming down here and dragging, creating more rows as well. Just trying to think of some little things that might be useful. Let's increase the size of this so you can see it a little bit better. And it's very important to understand the concept that Excel considers your, your first rows right up here to be your headers. So um, one other thing we might want to do is maybe get rid of some of this table formatting that is here by default. And also I'd like to come in here and first off and change the name of this. Let's just change this to sales and then let's also reorganize it so that it is placed after everything else that we've already worked on. Because I want you to be able to get this sheet and be able to understand everything and how it's placed in order. Let's come in here and change this theme up a little bit because I think it's kind of distracting. So um, let's say something a little less, uh, what do I want to do here? Okay, let's just do this. I like that. Okay, so we're focusing in here on our headers. Now, whenever we sort inside of Excel, it is all you need to do is just click anywhere where you would want to sort in this situation if we're going to sort contacts then we could just come in, select that one point right there, and then we just go right over here where it says uh, sort and filter, and pay particular attention to what's gonna happen here. A to Z, that's perfectly fine. And you're going to see that it goes and pulls in and automatically sorts whatever column that I'm clicking inside of. And another thing is it went and took that, that extra row that we had inside of there and moved it down to the bottom. We can just come in here and move this up to get rid of that if we would like to. Let's, however, come in here once again and create a new row. And we're just going to select a random row, go Control Shift, and we can go plus inside of there. Because it's very important to understand that if we come in here and we press Control A, we're going to go in and select all of those different rows here that you can see here on our sheet. Also, we can come in and select inside of here. I'm going to go in here and add in another column, and it's going to represent salespeople. And let's go format. Now we can do the auto fit column width. You can see that that works with the salesperson. Just throwing in some random salespeople just so that I can go in here and mess around showing you some other different really cool things. For example, let's say we would want to sort by salespeople so we could get a representation of exactly how many products a salesperson may have sold which would be very very valuable to us let's just come in and sort that now we can see the salesperson nine looks like they are the top salesperson out of the bunch 25 looks like they're doing a really bad job but what's even better than that is we can actually go and sort by multiple columns at the same time and this is called multi-column sort so you can just click anywhere inside of your list and then what we're going to do is we're going to go into our data section and then we want to go and click on our custom sort button. And that would be this guy right here. So let's click on that. And what we're going to be able to do is sort by salesperson. Okay, we already want to do that. And then we want to add a new level. And it's going to show um, sort by the sale price. And to do that, we can just say add new level. And just click inside of here. And sale price. And this is all good. And maybe we want to do largest to smallest, largest to smallest, click on OK. 
And now you're going to see that not only does it have the salesperson all sorted, because we said that is the main, most important thing that we wanted to focus on, but it also has all of the sales that that salesperson made, and they are all in order, which would also be very beneficial. Another common thing that we might want to do, however, is let's say we wanted to sort by month. Well, we just click inside of the month area, no problem, and just click right here, and we can see that we sorted by month. But we sorted in alphabetical order. Very often, that is not what we want to do. So let's say we want to sort from January through December. How would we do that? Well, we just click on our custom sort we have right here, and we can come in, select this, and we can delete that level if you'd like. And then we could say we want to add another level, and we're going to come in, and we're going to say we want to sort by month. And there is our month. And then what we're specifically going to say is we want to sort using a custom list. So we can click inside of here. Here's a custom list. And even better yet, they already have one pre-made. You can make a list if you'd like, but they already have one pre-made for our months. So that's very beneficial. Click on OK and then click on OK. And now you can see that we're sorting in the order that we would expect. Another thing that's very useful is because we have filter selected, say if we unselect filter, oops, unselect it, we're not going to see those little drop downs anymore. But in this situation, we want to use filter. And let's say we just wanted to see sales from salesperson nine. Well, we can come up here, click on this, and we can say select all no, and instead click on, on nine. And now we see just what we were looking for. And then we can do further sorts if we would like. And then, of course, we could come in and do select all. Click on OK and just that easily go back to the way that we were. Now let's say that we would like to come in here and since we have our product IDs all sorted, we would like to actually go and see some information in regards to how much of or how, how much earnings we would have received or price or sales we would have received for each of these individual items. Now a great option for doing that is our subtotal. But if I click on it, you can see it's grayed out. So that's sad. But it doesn't have to be sad for long. The reason why is you're not allowed to use subtotal with tables. So if you want to go and convert this back into a range, just go and right click inside of here, go down to tables, and then say convert to range. Right like that. This will permanently remove the query definition. Blah, 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 blah. That's fine. Just get rid of it. Okay, now you can see that subtotal has showed up, and subtotal is going to be able to show us how to do some really, really cool things. So what we want to do is we're going to click on subtotal, and we're going to say at each change in, well, what would we like to really focus in on? At each change in, how about product ID? So sale ID, that wouldn't do anything. So product ID, and what do we want to do? Well, we want to sum and what specifically would we like to do? Not some salesperson, that would just be silly. What we'd like to do is sum the sale price. I think that's good. And also the profit. I think both of those are both good. And then we can click on OK. And boom, just like that, you're going to see that it has all of our product IDs. And then at the end of it, it is going to sum up the total in sales as well as the total in profit. For each of those so pretty cool stuff let's go and undo that though so just get undo there you are control Z if you're wondering now I want to cover exactly what we would do if we had some duplicates let's click over inside of our sale ID and then just sort those really quickly now for our each of the sales there's only one identification number so that means if we have a duplicate then that could cause a problem Let's just go. I just went and held Control Shift and pressed to the right arrow key to copy that. Now I'm just going to copy this and I'm going to paste this down inside of there. Uh oh, now we have duplicates. What are we going to do in regards to getting rid of those? Well, what I'd like to do is I'm going to go and get rid of them and have Excel help me. You know, it's perfectly fine whenever we're dealing with small amounts of data. But whenever we have large amounts of data, it's much better if Excel helps us find our duplicate. So maybe we know for a fact that this column right here is going to be a column that we do not want any duplication inside of it. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're just going to say Control-Shift and down arrow, and we're going to select every single 
um, sale ID that we have inside of there. Then we can go over into home and we can do some conditional formatting. And let's say we want to highlight sale rules and we want to look for duplicate values. Boom, like that. And then we can say exactly how we want that to be styled. We're looking for duplicates and we hit OK. And then if we click out of here, you're going to see that it highlights any duplicates that are inside of our table. So let's just go in there and let's just delete it. OK, just like that. And I hit the delete key, not the, the backwards arrow delete. Now we are currently using our ranges here. Maybe we want to go back to formatting as a table. Um, the, how do we do that is we just go to our home tab and then we say format as table and then once again we go and pick whatever we were looking for. I'm just going to use this one and there you go. This is perfectly fine and click on OK. All right, so now we're working with tables just like we were previously. Now one interesting thing whenever you're working with tables is it's automatically going to give you some additional information. So for example, we could come over here and click on total row right like this and you're going to see that it is going to give us a total for all the salespeople but that doesn't really make any sense does it now let's undo that let's instead come in and say that we're interested in profits for example and we can do a total row whoops it went and grabbed that again let's come in here and fix that oh another thing this is kind of sloppy let's jump over into home and let's do format auto fit and there it is Okay, so where were we at here before? Now, we said that we don't really care about the totaling uh, these values. But what we can do and uh, is actually turn on the total row and then go in and select what we are interested in. So maybe we're interested in the totals for our sales price. Okay, so we'll come in here and select some. And there's the total for all of our sales. Maybe we're interested in the average we can click on that and we can get all that additional information and of course we can do that with all the other different parts as well and maybe we don't want this to show up so we click on none or maybe we decide we don't want this to show up and you can just see all of the different options that are available if you would add in that total row which is uh, a capability that is added whenever you're working with table design maybe we want to come in and remove some of the table formatting we have here we can just select anywhere inside of here go over here where the more is and just click on clear and that's going to go away and of course it didn't really show anything because i didn't have tons of styling but if you did that's how you would clear it let's come in here once again and make a duplicate so let's go and select this row right here and control shift and the right arrow just to go copy all that and let's go and paste that down inside of there okay so we have a duplicate you can actually see it's already red because we went and did the conditional formatting but you can also use the different table designs and such to be able to come in here and also remove duplicates you can see right here it says remove duplicates so just click on remove duplicates right like this and you're going to see that this is highlighted down here and you can come in and say do you want to delete duplicates based off of sale id contact we're really interested in duplicates just on our our sale id can i increase the size of this yes i can okay so we're interested in duplicates for sale id and nothing else because we might have duplicates in month or year or whatever so we'll click on okay and it says that there was no duplicates found. Oh, it didn't select that bottom part right there. I don't know. For some unknown reason, it didn't get that. Um, let's go and just delete it on its own. Okay, and let's move on. Another thing that's important to understand, and I know I talked about subtotal previously, but let's do like a little example. Let's come in here and let's talk about sales or something so I'm, what i'm going to do is i'm going to say sales well let's just do this in lowercase sales and sum and we're going to see the difference between subtotal and sum so let's get rid of that and then over here what we're going to do is we're going to call this sales subtotal so that you can see the difference between these two functions so what we're going to do for sales sum is I'm just going to do, you know, kind of what we always did. And I'm going to focus in here on our sales price. 
So we're going to say equal to sum, and then we're going to grab our sales price and paste that inside of there. And there you can see is our total sales price. Now what we want to do for subtotal instead is we're going to say equal to subtotal and we're going to do sales price again. But remember, we have to pick exactly what we're working with. So it's going to be nine in this situation, which is sum, which shows up inside of there. And then we're going to do the same thing. So sales price like this and hit enter. OK, those numbers are exactly the same. So you're probably saying to me, what is the point in showing me this? Well, the point is, is if we would come in here and say salesperson, for example. So let's unselect this and let's just do nine. Now watch these values over here. We hit OK. The sales subtotal changed based off the filter while the sum is still showing as if the filter was not applied. So there is another thing that is kind of cool to know about subtotal and how it would differ from our our uh, there, select that, and now they're both equal again. How it would differ from our regular sum. Now another thing that's kind of interesting is let's say that we would like to come in here and we would like to find the sum of the total laptop sales. Okay, so we're going to come in here. And what we need to do is focus in on exactly what we're searching for. Well, we're searching for the word laptop in the column called product type. So what we need to do is we need to say product type, and it has to be spelled exactly the same as it's spelled here in our header. And then what we're specifically looking for is the word laptop. And what we want to calculate from this is our sales and also our profit. And maybe we want to go and add some styling to this just to have this show up a little bit better. So what we're going to do is we're going to use something called DSUM and database sum is what that actually stands for. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in and say equal to DSUM like this. And then we have to say, okay, well, what are we searching for? And what we're going to be searching for is going to be this whole entire table that we have right there. Okay, so we have that all set up. And then what we're specifically looking in is going to be our headers. So we want to come in here and select these headers that we have inside of there. And what we're going to be looking for is product type. And then inside of the product type, column, we're specifically looking for our uh, uh, laptop on top of that. And on top of that, what we'd also like to do is not only get our headers, but we'd also like to get our sale price. So we're going to say that we want our headers, but specifically we want sale price. So I'm going to come in here and doctor this. So I'm going to go headers and down inside of here. I'm going to put a comma and specifically I'm looking for sale. Whoop, it's sale price. There it is. It found it for me. And then let's just close that off right like that. And then what I want to do is I want to use the information that is in product type and laptop. That is specifically what I am looking for and hit enter. And what it's going to do is just give me the sales for our, those items that are laptop items instead of giving me desktops and, and all of those other different things. And likewise, we would be able to come in here and also calculate our profits in basically the same exact way. So let's come in and say E D sum like that and go and select all our all of our data that we have inside of there and then we're looking for profit this time so let's just select this you can also do it this way i know i manually typed it in there before but there's no reason to do that and uh then finally what are we specifically looking for we're looking for those items in product type that have the name laptop boom and whoops i messed something up what did i do wrong in this situation Oops, this is supposed to be headers, not all. I should have just clicked on uh, profit. So 
But either way, hey, this is supposed to be headers. So let's get rid of that instead of all headers and profit. And there you can see is the profit just for the laptop items. Now we can even drill down even more. So for example, let's say that we would like to come in and get all sales for products with a specific ID, but better yet, all products that have, let's come in here and let's sort this. So let's just go and sort and filter, that's fine, and that, okay. So let's say we just wanna filter for, I'm looking for things with the same beginning letter, and that's G. All right, so let's say we would just want to get our sales for items, product IDs that begin with the letter G. So I'm gonna come in here like this, and I'm gonna say product ID, that's what we're targeting. Make sure this name is the same as that name right there. And then what are we specifically looking for? We're looking for G and we're gonna put a star inside of there. That represents anything that could possibly come after it. Okay, and we'll do more. This is a regular expression. We'll do more with regular expressions later on. So we'll come in, maybe we wanna highlight this, give this a little bit of styling so that looks a little bit better. And then we have to go into our sales area and actually work out the formula. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna use our database sum again. So we're gonna say D sum like this, and that we want to work with the entire table. So let's go select the entire table that we have right there. That's good. What would we like to do then? Well, then we're specifically looking for sale price. So we're gonna click sale price and we're gonna go after that. And we're gonna say that we're looking for in the product ID column, anything that begins with the letter G and uh, you know other characters after that, hit enter. And it's going to go and get our sales just for those things with the product ID that begins with the letter G. Now, just as a quick note, we used this little star here to represent any character and any number of characters. If you ever wanted to, example, match any single character, you would just put a question mark inside of there. But like I said, we'll get more into that as we continue. Now let's drill down even more. Let's say that we are looking for a sale ID that is greater than 19 and a product ID that begins with the letter I and anything after that. Well, what's normally done is you define your criteria and then you're gonna say sale ID is something I'm looking for and then product ID is something else that I am looking for. And maybe we wanna highlight all of those just to style those a little bit nicer. So we're gonna say greater than 19. We have to put this under here to find what the condition is we want to tie to this sale ID up here. And then we have to put another condition for our other condition, which is a product ID that begins with ID. And let's get rid of that. I don't want a styling on everything here. Yes, normal, there we are. Okay, so we have that all set up. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna come down here and we're gonna say something like I prods after 19. I don't know how to say that. I just came up with this weird wacky thing that I'm searching for out of my head and now I have to actually come in here and find it. So how are we going to do this extremely bizarre type of thing? Well, it's actually very, very simple. We just come in. Of course, we're going to be using our database sum again. So DB sum. And where are we going to be searching? We're going to be searching across this entire table that we have right here. And then what are we specifically looking for? Well, we said that we wanted sale price. So we're gonna come in and click on sale price. And then we just highlight all of the criteria right like that. And that's all we do. Whoops, you entered too few arguments. What did I do wrong? Oh, I forgot to select the other thing. Okay, that's at the end of this. Let's get rid of that. And then for this, this is going to be sale price. I don't know how I thought I clicked on that. And then we're gonna put another comma and then we select all of the criteria. And you can put as much criteria in here as you would like to really drill down. And there you can see that <laughs> kind of weird sort of search that we just performed there. But you may ask yourself, well, what if I want more than one thing? 
Okay, you're asking for everything. Well, you just put product ID in and you'll list more than one thing underneath of it. It's actually pretty simple. So, or maybe we wanna search for product type and laptops and desktops. Let's get both of them. So that would be product type like that. And then we're gonna say that we want desktops and we want laptops. And then we wanna go and what do we wanna calculate here? Maybe we wanna calculate sales for that and uh, add some styling to this. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? It's actually very simple, just like before. We're gonna say database sum like this. Where are we searching? We're searching the whole table. And also you can just select up here and go control shift right and left like that if you would like, um, whatever you'd like. Okay, so there we are. And what are we specifically looking for? Well, we're interested in sale price. So let's click sale price, right like that. And then we are specifically looking for product type, desktop and laptop. Boom, goes and calculates that also. Let's say that we would like to get the desktop sales for salesperson nine. How do we do that? Well, again, I'm gonna go and write criteria here just so somebody that's looking at this might be able to understand what type of crazy things I'm doing. So I'm saying that I'm looking for salesperson. Just, I know I've said this 50 times, but just make sure this is the same as that. That's what we're targeting here. And uh, salesperson and product type. And what are we going to do? Well, we're looking for salesperson nine and we're looking for product type, and that is going to be desktop like that. Let's go through a styling on this, make it look pretty. Okay, and then we can come down and we could say desktop sales by nine. And, oops, there we are. That's gonna fit inside of there. And then for this, we just come in, and again, we're gonna say database some just like we did previous and then um let's say you know what maybe we want to do do we want to try something a little bit different why not let's do uh average sales instead instead of some we'll say maybe we want to find out what is the average uh in regards to desktop sales for salesperson nine just to do something different how do you do that database average and there you can see and a whole bunch of other different functions popped up that are specific to this type of work. Okay, so we're gonna come in just like we did before. We're gonna say, hey, we wanna search across the entire table. And what are we interested in? Well, we're looking at sale price. Sale price is what we want to specifically target in at. And what are your what's your bizarre criteria? Well, that it be salesperson nine and the product type be desktops. There it is. That's the average desktop price for that. Um, let's do one more, and then I think you're, you're, you'll get the idea. Let's say that I wanted to find out, out of a gigantic table, it could be considerably bigger than this, how many t uh, tablets are we actually selling? Maybe we don't even want to carry tablets anymore. Well, we just say product type, like that, and then we're going to say tablets sold, like that. And down here, we're just gonna say tablet, and let's style this. And then down inside of it, what we can use is we can use database count instead. And it's just gonna count how many times it sees the word tablet inside of our product type area. So select everything. And then after that, what are we looking at? We are specifically going to say, uh, we can just we can just do sale price it doesn't really matter and click on that and then what are we specifically looking for we are looking for a product type and tablet boom we have sold four tablets so that's all the more tablets we have sold in our store so pretty cool stuff um another thing that you may want to do uh just because i had talked about importing different data is you can also export different data I don't really know if I have anything here that's sorted properly for that. However, um, if I just got rid of all of this information, which I could do, let's just 
get rid of well I don't really want to but if you wanted to export your your data to say a CSV or something you can just go into file and this would only work if you're working with one worksheet instead of multiple worksheets but then you would just come down here and click on file export you can export as numerous different types and you could also come up and just specifically save as and go to a specific area and you can also see that csv files the comma delimited right there xml data and all of the other different ways of formatting but we're just going to cancel that i just something that popped into my head at the moment and i thought i would cover it all right so there is a whole bunch of different ways to play around with tables and pull interesting information out of them and I've touched on it a little bit, but now I want to jump in with both feet and talk about validating data. All right, so now we're going to talk about validation. And what I'd like to do is go and import some new information. So I'm going to go to data and I want to import a CSV file. And I just thought you might not know what a CSV file is. Let's open one up. So I'm going to say open and notepad. And if you don't know, this is what a CSV file looks like. Headers across the top and each of the rows of data all separated with commas. So comma separated values is what we're, that's what CSV stands for. Let's close that. Okay, so let's come down inside of here and actually import that exact file. Employees, there it is. And we'll say import with this one. And you can see here is everything, okay? So this is exactly what it's gonna look like uh, whenever we import it. So that's perfectly fine. And let's come down here and let's just click on load. That looks perfectly fine. And it's going to create a brand new tab down here. And uh, just so that you can tell what's going on whenever you look at this, I'm going to name it validate. And here's the sales information. I'm going to bring this over here. So validate like this. And here's the sales stuff we did before. All right. First thing I want to do is I'm going to show you how to look for duplicates. So let's just copy this and paste this down. There's a, whoops, that didn't work, did it now? Let's just go copy and paste. There we go. So now we have some duplication inside of here. And I'm going to go through and show you a whole bunch of different ways to search for different formatting issues. So first thing I want to do is let's say that I would like to find and highlight any duplicate that are in my table. So I could just come in here. Uh, I could select the whole entire thing if I'd like. But let's just focus right now just on the IDs because I know I do not want duplication there. Well, if you just want to be informed of potential duplication, what we can do is go into conditional formatting like this, and then we can say highlight cells, rules, and duplicate values. And it's going to say right here, What's going to happen if there is duplication? Well, we're going to have a light red fill and a dark red text on a duplicate. So that seems fine. And if we click on OK, you're going to see that, yes, indeed, these are both highlighted and they are both red. And we can come in here and we could delete this row. And now you can see that it's no longer highlighted. So that's how we can use conditional formatting to highlight any potential problems that we might have. Uh, let's say that we would like to also, it's very important to select just the data whenever you're doing these, uh, these searches and this validation. Don't come up here and sele select the whole entire column, just the data part from Sam to Paul right here. What we're going to do is we are going to come in here and we're going to say that we want a defined minimum length for first name as well as a defined maximum for first name. So I'm gonna select my column values only, and let's use conditional formatting again. So I'm in home, here's conditional formatting, click on that, except this is going to be a very custom rule. So I'm gonna come down here where it says new rule, click on that, and then you're gonna come down here where it says use a formula, to determine which cells to format. You can't read that because it's very tiny. That's what it looks like. So we're gonna select it right there, and then in the box where it says format values where this formula is true, we are going to go in and we are going to put our, our formula inside of there. So where did my mouse go? All right. So we're going to come in here and we're going to define our rules. What are our rules going to be? Well, let's just say in this circumstance 
that I want the, the let's not define a maximum, but well, let's say that it must be at least two letters. Okay, so what we're going to do is say equals L-E-N, and we're going to put the very first item inside of here, which is going to be B2. So B2, and close that, and then less than 2, right like this. And then we're going to go zoom in here. That's exactly what it looks like. Then we're going to click over here where it says format so that we'll be able to define what happens if that rule is not set. We're going to click on fill and then I'm going to click on right here where it says where, where I have the second lightest color of orange. I think that looks pretty OK for me anyway. And then let's click on OK right like that and then OK again. And it's going to highlight every place where we did not properly put in at least two letters for the name. So let's say this is Diane, and let's say, and you can see the highlight went away, and let's say this is Eddie, and that highlight went away. Of course, we could do the same thing for the last name as well. Another thing I'd like to do, let's say that I want to come in and verify uh, all of my emails inside of here. Well, there is a, I'm going to use a special function just to use it, and it is called is a number. And is number is kind of interesting. What it does is it checks if a value is a number and either returns true or false. Now, if a number has text format inside of it, or if a number is considered text, it's going to return true. Hey, this is a number, even though it's text. One thing that's interesting about is number is that it is powerful when combined with other functions. So if a function returns true, it will often return a number, which is number will then mark as true. Otherwise, a, fun a function more than likely is going to return an error. And in that situation, is number is going to be marked as false. So let's say I want to come in here and I want to check if these are valid emails or not. And I'm going to use conditional formatting again. So I'm going to highlight all of these, conditional formatting, and I'm going to say I want a new rule. There's a new rule. I'm going to select down here. And then I'm going to define exactly what it means to be a, an email. So I'm going to say equals, and I want to highlight just the things that aren't emails. And I'm going to say is number, and I'll zoom in here in a second so you can see it. Um, I'm going to say match, and I'm going to say that this is going to be star, any number of characters, followed with, and I'm going to zoom in in a second, just give me a moment. Then it's going to have an at symbol. Then it's going to, this is a very simplistic definition of what an email is. Another star, any number of other characters. Then it's going to have a dot. And then it is going to have something after the dot, which is going to be a question mark, followed with a certain number of characters. And I'm going to start searching in D2, because that is the top of my search criteria error area. area. Okay, and now I can zoom in so you can see this. Okay, not is number match. And you can see exactly how I defined what is and what is not an email. Okay, good stuff. We'll say format. We'll do the same thing. A color of orange. Okay. And okay. And uh, whoops, what on earth do you not like here? Let's see. It says there's a problem with this formula. I'm not trying to type a formula. Da, 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 da. You typed cell shows too. Oh, this is just being silly. Let me just look and see what I may have done wrong with my formula here. So not is number. That's perfectly fine. And match. And then I have my everything defined inside of here. And uh, what could be wrong with this? Uh, oh, I see. I forgot an extra parenthesis at the very, very end of it. So let's just throw another parenthesis inside of there. And now mm -hmm. click on OK. Still doesn't like it. All right, what is up with this? I have no idea, but it works now. Um, <laughs> I just clicked on it twice, and then it went. Sometimes Excel does crazy things. Let's do manage rules, just so you can see. And here is the rule that we have right here. And edit rule. And if we zoom in, you can see. Not is number match. I don't know. Sometimes Excel does funny things, and so uh, we'll just get used to it. Okay, so we'll just say okay in this circumstance, and okay, and everything's fine. All right, and then you can see that it indeed did highlight the different things that are not valid email addresses. And I could come in here and type 
Now it is valid, so perfectly fine. And dot com. Now it's fine. And then Yahoo also fine. All right. So there is all of those different guys. Now let's get into department. And let's basically what I want to do here is I want to define what are valid department uh, values. You can see big man down here. That's not valid. Okay. Manager, secretary, all these other things, however, are indeed valid. And I'm going to work with those. So for this one, what I want to do is actually set up um, data validation where you're going to be able to pick these items from drop down lists to do so. Go into data and we're going to go to data validation and data validation right like this and then we're going to come in here and we're going to say custom in this circumstance let's see if i can zoom without breaking everything yes so we are going to select custom in this list that we have right here so let me just go in there and select custom oops went away sorry about that the little tool that i'm using is a little bit weird okay so i selected custom and then what I want to do is I want to come in and actually put something in there. You know what? I want this to be a list. And you know what? I want this to be a list instead. So I'm going to go in here. And then what I'm going to do is just type in manager and list everything separated with commas. So we have manager, secretary, and accounting. So these are all my valid things. Shipping and sales and janitorial and marketing and legal so there is a total list of every single thing that i want to be valid i'm going to hit okay and in this circumstance it is not going to highlight or tell me anything is wrong maybe if i come in here and go big man and then go out uh, maybe if i go into big man and go that yeah, see there it goes see what it does is it will say this value doesn't match the data validation restrictions defined for the cell. And later on, I'm going to show you how to actually put up a custom error message inside of there instead of getting what you have there. So let's say retry. And in this circumstance, I'll then click here. Yes, I know. Thank you very much. What's up? It's just being testy with me. So I'm going to come up here and then I'm going to come down and now I can pick something. And what is Mr. Nick Tortelli going to do? Well, he's going to work in marketing or something. I don't know. That's fine. All right. So now let's come in here and validate these zip codes that are all wrong. Um, actually, every single one of them is wrong now that I'm looking at it. Okay. So let's come in and let's select all of these. Actually, they might be wrong because of uh, their format. Let's see here. If I... Come in. Do they have a special for zip code? Yes, they do. And uh, you can see it right here. So there's a zip code special and the other different specials that they have. Ah, now they're showing properly. Okay, so I have to mess them up on purpose. So let's come in and let's go and just put 2108, 2108. Or is it, ah, it automatically adds it inside of there. What if I go in and um, it's always going to do it. Ah. So I don't want them to be set up like that now, do I? I want to get rid of that formatting. So let's come in and select this again. And let's change my format cells to general or text. Text, is text going to get rid? I'm looking for one that doesn't get rid of all of the, the zeros. If I do that, I guess this is kind of not a good thing. Maybe let's skip the zip codes because I see that it's just not working right there. Let's instead go into social security numbers. And I on purpose have some of these messed up. Let's say that we want to validate the length here. And uh, how can we do that? Well, we are going to select all of the social security numbers. And I'm going to go to data tab once again. And data validation is what I'm interested in. So I'm going to go data validation data validation and I'm going to say what are these these are whole numbers so there's an option here where I can select whole number and that's what I want to do in this situation so I'm going to select whole number and if it'll let me oh we got to get it again I have my little thing messed up again okay so you know I clicked on whole number 
whole number. And I'm going to say values between. Now, it's very important to understand. You can't just say that you want this to be nine digits or what is it? Uh, Social Security number is one, two, three, four. Yes, nine. I was right. What you're going to have to do is we're going to go and put in a whole host of ones. And then down here for maximum, I'm going to go and put the same number of nines. Okay, so just so you can see what that looks like. That is whole numbers, and you can see exactly the way that I set that up. Okay, good. So now let's say OK. And now if we go in here to one of these and then try to leave, you're going to get a message. Okay? And we'll say retry, and then maybe we'll throw a 1 inside of there. And now see it didn't give me an error. And then here, let's say that this is a 1 and a 2, and that's also valid. So you can see exactly how we're able to validate the social security numbers as well. And uh, well, I also said, I almost forgot. What if we want to do a custom error message on these? Well, what I want to do here is I want to go and select all of these like that. And I'm going to go into data validation again. So data validation and data validation. And what I want to do here, you can see that it's still set. I'm going to say error alert. I'm going to use this same little stop that's right here. But in the title section, I want to put some custom information. So let's say I want to say not a valid social security, whoops, social security number. And then down in the error message, I'll zoom in here in a second. I can say, please enter a valid social security number and we'll say it must be between the values of and we'll say that and that number right there okay so we have that set inside of there zoom in so you can see exactly what it looks like not a valid social security number and all of that information you can go and click if you'd like and i'm going to say okay and now what i'm going to do is i'm going to go in here and i'm going to make it non-valid and hit enter and now you can see it's actually showing the exact message that i put in so that's how we can go and not only make that super awesome but at the same time we'll go retry and we'll throw the three back inside of there and now it doesn't give me the error message, okay? So cool stuff, and that is how we handle validation. Now what I'd like to do is I think it's time for pivot tables. And basically what's cool about pivot tables is they allow you to analyze data from a list, and they allow you to edit them to define what data is summarized and how it is summarized. And it's best to see them in action to really understand the power of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and get some new sales information. So I'm on the data tab and I'm going to say from tech CSV and 100 sales records. So let's go and get those and this all looks fine and let's load it. It's going to go right here where it says 100 sales records and I'm going to call this sales 2 instead and uh, maybe I'll mess this up on purpose also. So we're going to go drag this over here. And just so you can see some other things. Because what I'm trying to do is come up with all the different things that you're probably going to want to do. You can see right here we have our date. Is there anything I want to get rid of first off? Um, I don't think so. I think this all looks pretty good. Okay. But one thing that I noticed here is you see date here. But very often, we're going to want to sort by month and year, and it would be useful to have those separated. Yes, I know they're already separated, but what I want to do instead is I actually want to go and delete these. So I want to come in and delete all of them and then show you how to take the date and make them again. So Because I think that is something that's pretty cool. So what I want to do here, um, I want to in here and split these up and put them exactly where they were. 
All right. So I want to go and I want to select my, my date column. So I got my date column right like that. And then I want to go into data like this. And then I want to go to from table range. This one up here. I'm click on it. And it's going to open up a brand new thing here. Well, that's pretty cool. And what I specifically want to do is go and get the dates and split them up into individual pieces. So you can see the dates are actually stored right here, the way those are all structured. And I am going to say that I want to split by the uh, forward slashes. So I'm going to select this and I'm going to say split column, right like that. And I'm going to say by delimiter is what I clicked on right there. And you can see it was smart. It went and automatically did the forward slash right there, exactly like I would want it to do. Okay, and I'm going to say OK. Click on OK. And you can see that it went in and it split up everything exactly like I would want, except it went and also put the, the time down here, which I do not want. So what are we going to do with that? Well, we're going to come in again. And we're going to say that we want to split the column by delimiter. And in this situation, it's going to be space. And we'll say OK. And then what we can simply do is come in here and get this time, which is pure nonsense because it's all just 12 noon because that's the, the default thing that we have inside of there. And I'm going to say that I want to remove that column. Um, actually, I want to remove this column also. Any other columns I'd like to remove? Um stay here yes well, let's remove all the extra columns that we have here click all of those and remove columns and they're all gone good and we have all of our information exactly as we would like it one thing however is you're going to notice that you're going to have some problems here in regards to working with dates because everything is is set up this way and i should have saved it so that i didn't have that problem but I didn't, okay? Sometimes whenever you're messing around, you forget to do certain things, and that is all cool. But let's go and do close and load and see what happens. So we'll do close and load. And yes, indeed, it got rid of that date. I wish it wouldn't have gotten rid of that date because it would have made my life so much more easy. But what we can simply do is go into our data once again. Um, let's say that right here, I decide, well, let's just click here because this part right here represents the month and I want to get rid of that anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go control shift and plus, and that's going to add in a new column. And then I'm going to go into our data section, load from CSV and get our hundred sales, just like we had before. Good stuff. Click on load. And because I was a dummy and forgot it, I went and deleted this. So instead, I'm going to come in and select it, copy it, and then I can go into oh, I have multiple sales records. Don't like that. Um, where did I go? Right here. Let's paste it inside of there. And then it's going to be very easy to convert from the date itself into just the month. So let's go and get rid of this column also. So that's going to be gone. And actually, let's do this and go and delete that all together. There, now it's gone. And then I want to go and convert this date right here into just its months. And I want to use names for those instead. And another thing that just is bothering me to death is the is the styling on this. So let's zoom in this also so that you can see these a little bit better. Um, if you want to get rid of this style, just click on this under table design and click on clear and say it's it's all gone now. And then you can also come in and let's say you just want something more simplistic. There you go. And you have all that set up. Um, anything else? Yeah, let's get rid of all the filters as well. So all those different arrows went away. That's good stuff. Now, if we want to come in and convert this into from being a date into instead being a month, because that's going to be very useful for us in regards to using our pivot tables, what we can do is we're going to select all of this information that we have right here. And then after that, we'll go to home 
And then we're going to say that we want this to be a number. Um, duh, duh, duh. And yes, number more. Oh, no, let's do custom uh, more. That's what I meant to do. And uh, we're going to have this be a custom. And then we're going to say that this is going to be months. And if you want the full month name, you just go in and put in four M's, lowercase M's. If you just want three, you can put in that. Let's go and get the full name, though, because that's what I'm pre uh, preferencing here. You could also go into the date and so forth and look for it, but I don't think it's there. So instead, I'm just going to go like this, MMM, to get the full entire date, which is right there. See exactly what it looks like. All right, and then we're going to say OK. And now you can see that we are sorting everything and converted everything into just the months, which is exactly what we're looking to do. Another thing I'm going to do is, well, I'm going to get rid of these all together. So I don't want them. Uh, so let's delete that. And let's delete this also because I don't need those. Delete. Yes, I want to permanently delete them. And then I want to come in here and select this. And I'm going to call this customers. Uh, customers like that and let's come in and paste I want to grab my customers from before um, they were they were previous employees but now they're customers okay so we have all that set up and then I can format this so that it auto fits all right so here's all my customers listed out here and all of their IDs are in order and then I'm gonna go into sales and then I'm gonna create inside of here a list of salespeople. But you may ask yourself, well, how exactly are you going to randomly throw in salespeople and customers for each of these? Well, first I'm gonna go sales person like that. And I am going to also put in customer. Uh, maybe with we'll a customer ID. So customer ID. All right, so we have all those set inside of there. And then I want to fill them with random things. So if we have, uh, we're not even going to have salespeople matched up with this because we don't need to. But what we want to do is fill this in with some random information. So if I want to generate some random values, what I can do here, let me all zoom in here so you can see this a little. Eh, you can just see it in a second. I'm going to say rand between, and let's say that we have, 10 sales, uh, 10 sales people with the IDs 1 through 10. And you can see that it went and automatically generated all those for us, which is very useful. But they are actually formulas, but we'll get back to that later. Now let's get into the customers. How many customers do we have? We have uh, 26 different customers. So we'll do the same thing for our customers. We'll say equal rand between and one through 26 and this is going to automate you see both of those updated that's that's a bad thing we don't we don't want that to happen so what we're going to do instead is i don't know a quicker way of doing this i'm just going to cut those out of there and then i'm going to open up notepad notepad and let's come in here there's notepad and i'm going to paste them inside of there Select them again, copy. This is like a silly thing I do. There's probably a quicker way of doing this, but this is what I'm doing. And then I'm going to paste those inside of there. And now they shouldn't show up as formulas, but just simply as numbers. If you don't do this, it's going to every single time you update your worksheet, it's going to generate random values. You don't want that. Okay, so that's a quick way of very easily going and putting random values in there and having them be values instead of formulas, which you don't want. Now I want to delete these extra columns we have inside of here. So let's just go and select all those. And then you can right click on it and we can say that we want to delete all of those and it automatically moves everything else over. And I don't believe I have anything else here that uh, we need to do or we need to do anything with. All right, so that's good. So now what do we want to do? Well, we want this to be converted into a a uh, pivot table that was the whole point of this but we needed to create everything so this is formatted as a table and uh, let's keep that and it's very important to keep this uh, as a table whenever you're working with pivot tables and what's important about this is if the table is ever updated 
then the pivot table is also going to be updated. So, and how you do that is just home and format as table if you don't remember. Another thing that's important to know is if we click on table design, this has a name. This is 100 sales records is what its current name is. I don't want it to be called 100 sales records. I would prefer that this table name be um, maybe sales two, okay? So I went and changed this to sales two instead of 100 table, whatever it was. Okay, so that's also very important. And that, that value there is going to be used by your pivot table whenever you create it. So what we wanna do now is we wanna go into insert and with insert, we're going to insert a pivot table. So we're gonna go up here and pivot table. Just click on the guy right like this. And we're gonna see that it's asking, do you wanna use sales two as your table? Yes, indeed, I want to use that. And um, new worksheet. Yes, I want both of those options. That's what I want. All right, so click on OK. And then you're going to see it says pivot table over here. Well, what you have to do is you need to define exactly what is going to show up inside of your pivot table. And I have no idea why the text here is so ridiculously tiny. I'll zoom in. Don't worry about it. So what I want to do here is I want to go and get monthly information. I want to get total profit and I want to get the items in the columns across the different months all listed. So what we're specifically looking for is rows of months. So you probably can't see it because it's so tiny, but that's where rows it. That's where rows are then you have values, then you have columns, then you have filters. We'll get to filters in a minute. We're gonna mainly focus on rows, columns, and values. So what I specifically wanna do is I wanna get rows of months. So I'm gonna go in here and I am going to grab the months. Where is the month at? Oh, oh, I don't know why it's not showing months. That is weird. I thought I did a pivot table on that specific month. Hmm, let me see here. Maybe not. Let's kill this. So uh, do I want to save it? No, I don't. And let's open up our other sheet that we have here. So now let's try this again. So we are here and we want to create our pivot table. So we want to go to table design for this guy right here. And then we want this to be a pivot table. So we want to create this as a pivot table. So we're going to go insert and we're gonna say pivot table, and we're going to say that we want to use from table range, okay, good stuff, sales to, and we want to use a new worksheet just like we did before, um, and all of that looks very good. And now we can see that everything shows up. Don't know what happened the first time, maybe Excel had a hiccup or something. And now everything's bigger too, so we can actually see it. All right, so what did I say? So I wanted um, rows of months. So we're going to go up, grab month, drag it down here, and we don't want quarters and years. So let's just go and get rid of those. I'm going to go in and I'm going to say, well, actually, what you can just do is drag them back up here. So if you don't want them, that's the easiest way of doing it. All right. So now we just have rows of all of our different months. What else did we say? Well, we're interested in profit totals. So what we want to do is find total profit, and that is the value we're interested in right there and now you can see it is showing let me zoom in here so you can see it this is a pivot table so it's showing the months and then how much profit we had now what i'm also interested in is what specific products what specific item types and how much profit we earn from those uh, for each of the individual months well to find that out what we do is we look for item type where is item type item type and drag that down for our columns. So we're defining our rows, our columns, and then what is our final value we're most interested in. And let me zoom out here a little bit so you can see that. So there is our grand total. And you can see exactly that everything is broken down exactly that w in the way that we would be interested. Now let's say that we want to then focus in on sales by salesperson. Well, that's perfectly fine. We could just go into month and get rid of that. 
And instead, we're looking for salesperson. So drag salesperson down, boom. Now all of a sudden we can see all of the, the same information, but pertaining just to specific salespeople. Now let's say that we would like to not only look at um, our, our months and, and everything else, but we'd also like to look at this on a quarterly basis. So let's go and get salespeople and throw that out of there. And instead, let's throw months inside of there like we did before. And you can also see that everything is going to be, let's get rid of years and just leave quarters. And you can see that now everything has been grouped together into individual quarters so that you can break it down. It's just ridiculously powerful how we can mess around with all these different things. Now, of course, you're going to be able to edit things inside of a pivot table just as you would inside of any other table. So, for example, one thing that's bothering me is over here where we have our grand total. You're going to be able to come in here and also have these set up. As currency, you could go into total profit that we have over inside of here, view, um, view field settings that we have right there, show values as, and you can do all sorts of other different calculations and so forth if you'd like. Let's just do number format and let's say currency like this and then click on OK. And you can see that now everything is showing up as currency as it should. Another thing that is interesting is let's say we would like to have an average for a profit. Well, what we can do is we can actually have two uh, total profits down inside of here. Click this and it comes up as total profit two. And we could say uh, view, view uh, field settings and average and click on OK. And it's not only going to show, it's going, it's going to show the averages for all of these different values and so forth. Kind of a mess though. I just wanted to show you that. Um, what else could we do here? Um, also added all sorts of additional information. Let's get rid of that also. All right, let's just stick with our currency. I like that. Another thing we can do is we can also compare different rows. So let's say, for example, we would like to see the changing of profit month to month, but we do not want all this extraneous information in regards to item type. Well, we can just go grab item type, Throw that out of there. And then we're specifically going to compare how the profits are going to change from month to month. So we're going to start with January. So we want to find out how much. It wouldn't make sense. There's no data up here for January. So we're going to go and calculate how much did the total profits change from January to February, February to March, and so forth and so on. So let's go and throw another total profit down inside of here. I grab it. Nope, I missed it. Let's grab it. Throw it down inside of there, and you can see it's just repeating the information in this situation. But what I want is a difference. So I want to value field settings. I don't know if I've shown you this before, so let's zoom in on it so you can see it really good. Uh, that can't do it. All right, it just you have to trust me or you have to look at this full screen. So value field settings, and then what I need to do is show value as, and it says no calculation by default. Instead, I'm going to pick a uh, calculation, and the calculation I'm specifically looking for is percentage difference from, and it is this guy right here. And what I want to specifically look at is for my field, it's going to be month to month, and then specifically I'm looking for February. I can zoom in on this. So you can see percentage difference from month to month starting with February. That is what I'm looking for. And then we can click on OK for that. And now you can see how the different profits are changing over this period of time. Actually, that is not incorrect. That is incorrect. I don't want to do it from February. I want to do it from January. So let's go back inside of here like this and value field settings. And this is going to be January, not February. It wouldn't make sense. Otherwise, it would just be zero for the February. So just so you can see the change I made. See, I changed that to January instead of February. And now it should work. All right. Let's get that and click on OK. And yes, you can see there was 151. This is all randomly generated data, so it's not really going to look make any sense. But you can see we increased our profits by 151% from January to February. Then it decreased by 67. And then it bounced around after that. So that is how we can come in and compare different rows. 
Now, another thing we can do with pivot tables is just like we did with regular tables is we are going to be able to create what are called pivot charts. So I want to come in here and uh, select my pivot table. And I'm looking at specifically pivot table analyzed. And inside of here, we're going to have the option of a creating a pivot chart. So we're going to select our pivot chart. And then we can select between all of these different options for different charts. And I'm just going to click on column and click on OK. And you can see right here that it is automatically going to generate a chart that we're going to be able to mess around with. And you can see that we're going to be able to, let's say, well, it wouldn't make any sense. We need all the different months on there. But you can see it has the same type of options. Like maybe you, you only want January. Whoops. Let's do a unselect uh, unselect all for this. And then maybe we want January to April and April to July and then to October or something like that. You can just easily manipulate those. And you can also see that whenever you make changes to the chart, that it is actually going to update the information that is on the pivot table itself. And we'll do select all again, select all and click on OK. And now we can see all of the information there all at the same time. Another thing that's interesting is you can use a thing called a slicer. So let's just click inside of our table. And then we want to go to pivot table analyze once again. And then we're specifically going to say that we want to insert slicer. And that's right here. So insert slicer. And then what we can do is let's say we want to click on salesperson. So salesperson like this. And now what we're going to be able to do is just very easily, and you can actually create multiple of these, you can click on these and it's going to show you just the salesperson month over the month period. And you can also see every single time I change the salesperson that it is highlighting only those months in the, in which they specifically have sales. I mean, it's, it's just, it never ends. It is so ridiculously cool. Um, just, just, just love this stuff. All right. And then it goes back to its normal way. So pretty ridiculously cool things. And then we can cycle through all of these different changes as well. All right. So there you go. That is a whole bunch of different ways that we can work with pivots tables as well as pivot charts. All right. Now we're going to talk about Power Pivot. And what Power Pivot allows us to do is to really work with large data sets and create relationships between them, which is really cool. I already have Power Pivot set up. I'm going to show you how to get it because it's an add on. If I didn't mention that, you're just going to go down here at the bottom where it says options and then go to add ins. I called it an add on. It's an add in. OK, so we're just going to come in here and we are going to select it. And you can come down here where you have Excel add ins. And if you go to com add ins and select that, you're going to then see you'll have the option to go and install Power Pivot. So we're going to I have the Acrobat PDF maker inside of here. And also, you just want to make sure you have a check mark right here where it says Microsoft Power Pivot for Excel. And let's zoom in here just to show you make sure you can see it. OK, and then you're going to hit OK. And then after you do that, it's going to install it and you're going to see Power Pivot right here. OK, so what are we going to do now? Well, we're going to create, I went and copied everything from sales two into sales three, just so everything will be separated or actually I didn't let's jump over here and let's copy everything over inside of there. So let's go paste us here. Boom. And, uh, we can go into file. Oops. Didn't mean to go file. I meant to go home and let's go into this and say format and auto, uh, set up the width or the columns. Okay, so we have that all set up. Now that's in sale, that's sales three, and then we have customers here. And what we're going to do is merge them. So, what you want to do here first is select customers. Then you're going to go into Power Pivot right here. And then you're going to say that you want to add it to our data model just by clicking right here. This is going to open up a brand new window. And you can say, yes, everything. We want everything here. Okay, where is the data in your table? All right. Boom. Okay. So we have all of that set up. Whoops. Did I not select it right? Ooh, duh. Let's just kill that. Oh, I, I somehow got this over here. Let's get rid of this altogether. I have no idea how it selected that. Let's just delete it. Okay. 
So let's come in here, select all of this, and then go to Power Pivot, and then go add that data model. And it should populate, and it did. Now, a data model, like I said before, is can contain single or multiple different worksheets. Let's zoom in here. Another thing you may notice is up here, you're going to be able to pull external data from databases and multiple other different sources. So that's also an option. We're not gonna do that right now, however. Now what we wanna do is we want to name this customers down here. What do we have here? Let's delete table five altogether. So delete, and yes, I want to get rid of that. And then our customers table right here, it's called table four way at the bottom. We're gonna call this customers and we're going to use all uppercase letters if you can't see that okay let's come down here and there's customers see there it is all right so what we're going to do now is get out of that and we will continue we want to close this now we just want to minimize it so let's just minimize this down and we want to come in well, let's just go like this get rid of it Okay, so now we're gonna do the same with our sales and make sure that we have this selected. So sales, uh, sales three, uh, control shift, right, left with arrow keys and power pivot, and then add to data model. And then we have to come down at the bottom and rename this sales three if we would like. It says sales 23, let's name this sales three, just like we did before. Okay, have all that set up properly now. Now, if we want to have these two tables properly connected to each other, how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to do it using customer ID. So we have customer ID here. And then, of course, each of the customers also has an ID right here. So how we merge them together so that they can talk is we click on diagram view at the top. And let's increase this so you can see everything. Here's the customer ID right here. And then you're also going to have a customer ID right here. So we're just gonna click on ID in the customers table and with the left mouse button and connect it to the customer ID that we have down here. Now that we have that set up, we can go back into our data view, just like we were in previously. And I wanna make sure I have my customers tab clicked on. And then I'm gonna to go to pivot table. So pivot table right here and the pivot table drop down. And what we want to click on is pivot table, which is right at the top. Let's see if I can show it to you. See, pivot table, right like that. So we're going to go like this and pivot table. Yes, we are going to say that we want a new worksheet. So click on OK. And it's very important to understand that anything formatted as a table is going to show up. So you can see we have our customer's information and we also have sales three but also sales two and table two, whatever that is, is also formatted as a table. So those are also going to show up. So just important to understand that. So what I want to do here is I want to drag customers down into our row. So let's go. And uh, maybe we want to do state uh, down in the row. So we're going to have customers by state. That's what we're going to be analyzing. And then in sales three, let's look at some other additional information. Maybe we want to look at total profit. So total profit is right here. We're gonna grab that and drop that down into values just like we used profit before to analyze. And then what we're interested in analyzing on a column basis, we could use any of these things, but let's say that we are specifically looking at specific items that's sold. And you can see right there, we're able to pull information from both tables and combine them into really nice information. Let's call this pivot table just to give it a name. So pivot table. And uh, I think that's, that's good. All right, so pivot table. And then what we want to do is we want to show that if we put calculations in these different tables that the calculations will also show up, which is kind of cool. So let's try maybe doing that in sales. And what type of a calculation would we like to do? Maybe we'd like to see if um, how we can manipulate our unit costs to increase our overall profit. 
just purely making this up. So I'm just going to go in here to our unit cost, right, like this. And um, down, let's go into home after that. And what would we like to calculate here? Now what I want to do is show that if we go and actually make calculations, that we're going to be able to also pull those into our pivot table like this. So let's go and open up our other worksheet that we had down inside of here. So power pivot for Excel. And let's specifically go into our sales area. And let's say that we're looking to maximize our profits. What is something that we could do? Well, maybe we could come in here and analyze unit cost and then make a determination on if we were able to lower our unit cost by a certain percentage, it, how many different states are meeting those guidelines to increase overall profits. Well, if we're in the Home tab, we can just go up here to Auto Sum and Average, right like that. And what it's doing for us is calculating our average unit cost, which is $191.48, okay? So that is our unit cost. Well, what we can do now is we can actually access this information. Let's go and save this. We can actually access this information over in our other worksheet. So we're just gonna click here and I'm gonna go Excel tutorial one. And if we go into sales, you're going to see that we now have our average unit cost inside of there. But maybe we want to do something a little bit more interesting. Let's go back to Power Pivot. And what's interesting about this is that we, let's, what I'm thinking I want to do is I want to create what is called a key performance indicator. And you can do that just by coming up here. And what it's going to do is it's going to allow us to show little symbols that are going to represent which states are meeting a certain guideline for cost of unit uh, unit costs and which ones are not. I don't know. I'm just totally making this up. But this is something you definitely do. It would be better, very, very, very beneficial. So let's go create KPI. And in the, it's basically showing you red would be considered bad, yellow would be considered average, and green would be considered good. So what I want us to do is figure out exactly what would be a good price. Um, I'm at 191 and just for no real reason, let's say that I want to come in here and define an absolute value. And let's say that we were able to lower our price for per unit cost average to 185. I don't know, just throwing that out there, okay? So that is our goal. And then in this circumstance, um, you could you could define different little symbols that you would like to use for which is meeting guidelines and which is not. I would also like to flip this from green because green, the lower, is actually better in this circumstance, not a higher value if you understand. So a unit cost that would be lower than our 185 would be considered even better. So let's bring this and flip it. And I can do that just by clicking these little guys right here. And uh, is there anything else that I would like to do with this? I don't think so. I think that's that would be interesting. So let's click on OK with that. Now we can go back to our uh, little pivot table worksheet. So power pivot. Here we are. Let's, oh, that would be this one. Yeah, this is the one that we're looking for. OK, and now we're going to see. Here is our average unit cost down here. Actually, it didn't update for some reason. Let's go in here and look at Power Pivot. Do I have to save this? Let's try saving it, see if that fixes it. And it did. And now what we can do is we can come down here to average unit cost. And now you're going to see there is additional information. One of those things is the status. And the status is going to be represented with those little um, symbols that we saw that are either going to be good or bad. And now what we want to do is we want to go and remove what we have inside of columns because we're only interested in the unit cost and uh, how that's going to work out for us. And um, are we going to do any? Yes, we want to still keep the state information in there as well. 
And then we want to grab our status and drag that and pull that down inside of here. And if we do, we're going to see our total profit, but then we're also going to see whether the unit costs are playing out or not. Let's uh, zoom out of that. I think you can see it. And if I just zoom in like this, there we are. So just some really interesting and cool ways of messing around with these tables and analyzing the data in multiple different ways, utilizing the power of Power Pivot. And of course, you can go around and play around to see what else you can come up with. All right, so I'm going to go and make some changes to our original monthly budget template that we created a little bit earlier. This is going to be called Excel underscore tutorial two, if you go and get this at GitHub. Now, what I'm going to do here is just make this a little bit nicer and at the same time show you a whole bunch of new tricks. All right, one of the tricks is I want to come in here and I want to go and get my monthly housing transportation. And you should be typing this in with me to get the best results. Like you should just literally be doing this, not staring at a completed, um, you know, worksheet. Uh, that would not help you at all. All right. So let's go and let's say I want to go and get the totals for each of these. One thing that would be very beneficial and would make my formulas make a lot more sense is if I name my ranges of cells. So I am going to do that. And how you do it is you just highlight this right here. And then up here at the top, you may notice it says B10. It is just giving me the value for that cell. But I want to name this whole entire row. So to do so, you just come up here and select it. And I'm going to say HO for housing underscore month underscore one and if you want to see what that looks like well i'm just going to enter all right so it's called hom1 all right and now i'm going to be able to refer to that over here so i can just say equal to sum and h under or ho underscore m underscore one and hit enter and it's going to go and calculate that for me and likewise, I'm going to do the same for all of these other guys. So I'm going to highlight this whole entire thing and I'm going to call it HO underscore M underscore uh, two and do the same for this one as well. So select that and HO M underscore three and get all those calculations. Now, one negative to doing this is you might think, well, Excel is going to be really smart. It's going to be able to figure out I want the second column. Well, if I do copy and paste, it's going to give you the same. So that is the negative to using named ranges is this is not going to be a relative link like you may be used to. So that is one of the negatives. I think that the positives outweigh the negatives, however. So I'm going to come in again. And I'm going to say equal to sum H O M. And this is uh, two or no. Yeah, two. There we are. And then do the same for the next one. So sum and you can also say if I go H O and you can see that it pops up. Maybe you can't see. Can I zoom in without it breaking? Yes, I can say it says H O underscore M three. And it gives me that. And that's like a shortcut so that's a good thing so we can do this and that whoops why didn't it work i don't know i didn't take all right let's <laughs> ho m underscore three and there you can see that is a way that we can go and put those inside of there and i think it's really super awesome and i'm just going to pause the video fill in the rest of them and you could pause the video also and do this as practice all right, and then I'm back, and you're going to see here I, I, we did housing. And if I click on transportation or highlight all of transportation, you could see also that that's TRM1. And if I go and highlight all of this, this is going to show up as IN for insurance, M1, and then for entertainment. I went and put, let's zoom in, 
EN, M1, and then it's M2 and all that, of course, from there on. And then also for loans, I only selected one of those in that situation, so it's LOM1. And then we can just come in, and I thought I'd show you this. We go equal to, and we say sum, and this is transportation. If I go TR, this is going to be TRM3. See, TRM3. Don't know if you can see that. TRM3. And if I just hit tab, I messed it up whenever I messed this up, I think. There we are. Now it goes in. All right. So we can just come in here and fairly quickly, I N, and this is two. And then it's going to be equal to sum equal to E N, that one. And uh, equal to sum is equal to, and this is LO2, like that. And then we can just do it for all the individual parts here. And I'll zoom in a little bit or something, just so you can see it a little bit better. Sum, and this is insurance, and this is the third one. And then we'll have also for entertainment. And this will be the third one. And I'm hitting tab there after I highlight, you know, the what I want to, to sum. And this is going to be hello, get that, tab, and enter. All right. So there we go. We just went and calculated all those. And now everything is using names instead of what we had used before. Now, whenever we're coming down to the part where we have cash left instead of you may notice this um whenever we originally set this up excel will make you will allow you to do weird things so remember i changed the format and it, they'll allow you to do really strange things until those strange things break and i did this on purpose just so i could show you these things all right so it's saying that it's summing from 8 through 44 it's like what 44, we don't even have 44, but remember we used to have 44. So we went and took all of these, they used to be down here, moved them over here and Excel's like, yeah, whatever, we'll just leave it as 44 and everything will be fine. Yeah, it'll be fine until it isn't fine. So I, it's much better to correct this from the beginning rather than allow those things to sort of linger. So what we want to do is we want to change our cash left. And what we can do now, because we have everything here, we have housing, transportation, insurance, entertainment, and loans all here, we can sum this column. And then after we sum that column, we can go and also subtract from our total income, our taxes, and then it will work and it'll totally make sense. So what we want to do, we still want to use B7. Hey, maybe B7 would be total income and make your formulas make a lot more sense. And uh, I'd advise it. But for now, I'm going to say um, I'm not going to do that. So we're going to leave this as B7, which is this guy, minus sum of, and it's going to be this down here, though. So we're going to go into the sum part like this, get rid of that, and instead put this sum inside of there like this. And then we're going to subtract the taxes, which is this. So we'll say minus, and then it's going to be the taxes, the tax amount that we have to pay also. And you're going to see that things are actually being corrected here. There were bugs that were not calculating things right, and uh, now we're fixing all of those bugs. All right, and then we got to do the same thing here for this. So we'll say C7, which is C7, this guy right here. And we're going to change our sum, however, and it's going to be using all of our budget. So we'll go in, select that, and then also we will subtract out in this situation our taxes. See, there were bugs in there, but we were just not seeing them. And sometimes it's important to understand that Excel might not point out those bugs. So let's come in here and get rid of that throw all of these expenses in there, and then afterwards subtract out our taxes. Boom. See, things have changed a lot, and it's largely because of those errors that we had before. 
Okay, so now that we have our cache left uh, set up properly and everything is making a lot more sense, we can move on from here. Now, another thing that's kind of interesting is you can go and jump to these different cells if you click on this and it's going to automatically highlight those. And this is going to work across your entire workbook for, you know, everything. It'll jump to specific sheets now that they're named and that's really cool. Um, another thing that is important to understand is where exactly this information resides. So we can go into formulas and we can go into define names like this. And then we can go into our name manager, which is right there. So let's just click on name manager and it's going to show you every single named range that you have created across your entire workbook. So very, very useful and cool information. But we're just going to say, nah, we're not interested in that right now. All right, so now what I'd like to do is actually show some different characters on the screen that are going to represent whether I am reaching my goal, which is lowering expenses, which as you can see right here, I am not. Okay, so what can we do here? Um, well, we could go and we could put different icons up using conditional formatting. I already showed you how to do that. So why don't I try something different? Let's say that we would actually want to put a character inside of here. So what I want to do is go to insert and I'm going to say symbol. And let's look for something that would be representative of success and failure when it comes to meeting our goals of lowering expenses. Well, there's an X right there. That's a good one. And we can just come in here and click on insert. But what's really important here is to focus in on this part where it says wingdings251, okay? Because that is going to be a character code that we're going to be able to use to display that character on the screen. And uh, let me just get out of that. And another one, I think, would be the check mark. You can see there is the X right there. And let's say close on this. So what did we say? 251 was the character code there. And then let's do another insert and let's do this check mark. And that is 252. So let's insert that and uh, let's close this and we'll say 252. All right. So now what we can do is come over here under here and let's say that we want either a check mark or an X. We already know it's going to be an X to show up if this number isn't less than this number. Well, we can use if for this. So we'll say something like equal to if, whoops, make sure I have this set for wingdings as a font. So let's not do that. Whoops, go back here and let's go back to home and wingdings. No, we don't want wingdings in there as our font. So let's use Calabri. Okay, so come back in here again and we'll say, equal to, and if, and let's move that mouse out of the way, and I'm going to say if, and what are we checking for? Well, if, um, what should I do, greater than or less than? If this is less than this, well, in that circumstance, I want, that would mean that we are decreasing our overall costs. I would want to use the check mark in that situation. So I'm going to say character and we'll change that to 252. So that is if we are lowering our overall spending, then we want to use the check mark as a positive. And otherwise, we want to use 251, which is going to be our X. So we'll go like this and you'll see that it is not what we think it should be. That's just because it is not a wingding. Okay. So we need to go and copy this over to the next part. We can just drag that over and then we can keep both of them highlighted, go into home and then change these into wingdings and then they will show up properly. So we'll say wingdings and you'll see they both show up as X. Now there is not that much difference between these two guys. So we can see if we come in here, let's just zero out electricity. Okay. I know we need electricity, but let's just say we're very determined to lower our expenses. And, oh, I accidentally put it in the first month. Let's get rid of that. Put it in the second month. So we'll say zero. And we have, yeah, then now you can see it changed into a check mark. 
But of course, we'd have to do without electricity, and that's a no-no. I just wanted to demonstrate that that actually worked, however. Now let's go and do something similar, but I want to demonstrate or in this circumstance. So I'm just going to come under here, and I'm going to do a check to see if I am lowering my discretionary spending. And so bring this here, and I can just double-click that. Okay. So what are we going to do here? Well, we're going to have to start with this month because we can't compare it to December because we don't have data on December. So for this, I'm going to come in and I'm going to say, let's use an or statement here. Let's do multiple different ors. So what should we do? Well, I think a good thing would be to check just two things up here. So money, our movies are definitely discretionary, and restaurants are also discretionary. You don't, and you're not forced to go to a restaurant. So I'm going to say equal to, and what we're going to check here is we're going to say if and or. So we're going to say if we lowered our spending on movies or restaurants in this circumstance, I'm going to do certain things. So I'm going to make this a compound statement, and I'm going to say. If, let's check uh, restaurants out first. So if we subtract this from this and we lowered it, then we should get a negative number. So we're going to say this in this circumstance would be this minus this. Okay. If that is less than zero, well, that we did lower discretionary expenses. And let's do another one. With an or statement, we can do both of them. Then we could say this minus this. If that's less than zero, well, then we lower discretionary expenses at, uh, once again. Okay, so that's a positive. So let's close that off. And then we're going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to say if it's true, we're going to show a check mark. And otherwise, we're going to say that we want to show an X, which is 251. Close that off. And you can see there's a U there again. We will correct that by just changing the font to Wingdings. Copied it to both of them. And then come up here, change this to Wingdings, way down here. And you can see that, yes, indeed, we did lower one of our discretionary expenses, either movies or restaurants that month. But then we went and overspent and did a bad job on the next month. So there is another way for us to use the or statement. Now let's say we want to use count if, which is quite useful. What it allows us to do is to count how many um, expenses meet a certain uh, check or some cert a certain comparison. So let's come over here and let's go and see if we are noticing a decrease in the percentage that is being spent from the January to March. So like we had done before, we're going to go into the, let's go and increase the size of this. Okay, so we're going to say equal to, and I'm going to say if, and this right here, this percentage minus this percentage, if that is less than, zero. Well, in that specific situation, I'm going to say that yes, it is decreasing. Otherwise, I'm going to say no, it is not decreasing. Okay, we can close that off. And we'll see that no, they're exactly the same. So no, indeed, that is not. We can just come down here, drag all those. And we can see in two situations, our gas is decreasing, I guess, by some percentage that's not being displayed. And also, it is showing that our fuel is decreasing by some uh, percentage. I'm sure if I went and increased the number of decimal places, which, remember, I can do just by pressing that little icon up inside of there, that it would show it. But let's just trust that, and indeed, it is true. Then what I want to do is I want to come down here, and I want to count a value if it is yes. So I'm going to come in here, and what should I say? Let's say number of expenses lower in the quarter. Whoops, and I said it as wingdings. Let's just come in and get rid of that, change that back to Calabri. So let's bring 
this back. And Calabri. Okay. Number of expenses lower per quarter. And this is just going to be one value. And how I'm going to be able to count this is I'm going to say count if. So count if. And I'm going to go through all of these different values right here. And I'm going to say I'm going to count them if they have a value of yes. So let's go and put that inside of there. Move that mouse out of the way. Whoops. What are you doing, you silly thing? I'll put yes -y. Okay. Put that there. And you see we come back with two. So that is what count if does. It's basically going to count the value if it actually exists in there. And so the number of yeses is basically what it is providing to us, which is just another tool for us to use. Another thing that is very interesting is sometimes we want to know what parts of our worksheet are actually affecting a calculation. So, for example, if we wanted to find out what is affecting this formula we have right here, we're specifically looking at formulas. We can just go into formulas like that. And then you're going to see in this area right here, it says trace uh, precedence and dependence. Precedence is going to be what makes it up. And then dependence is going to be what formulas are dependent upon that cell. Okay, so let's go find that out. So what is, depend what is that dependent upon? That is dependent upon these cells right here. Exactly what you would think. And then are these descent, um, cells that we have here, are they dependent upon something? Well, you can just keep going back and find out. And it goes blah. And you know that, indeed, those are values that are just placed inside of there. And we can just click on remove arrows to get rid of that. Likewise, we could come over here to this formula and decide what cells are, is it dependent upon? So it's dependent upon these. Okay, are these cells right here dependent upon anything? Yes, they are. They're dependent upon these values over here. So it's a very nice, easy, interesting way for us to be able to figure out what cells on the sheet or on our worksheet are going to be part of calculating a formula. We could then come in and say this, this income total over here. Um, what formulas depend on that? Click on this and you can see that many of these different formulas are going to depend upon that. Okay, so very, very interesting to, to know and be able to track along and see where errors may be coming from on your worksheet whenever you're working with different formulas. Another thing that's very interesting is sometimes you don't want to actually see the value right here. What we're more interested in doing is actually seeing the formula. Well, if that is true, just click on show formulas and then guess what? You're going to get exactly what you're looking for. Show formulas and boom. Now it shows all the different formulas that you have instead of the calculations for each of those formulas. Click it back and it just goes away. Another thing you're probably going to want to do is you're going to want to use values from one worksheet inside of another worksheet. So let's create another sheet. And what are we going to call this? Let's call this quarterly budget. Okay, got that set. And then what we're going to do up inside of here is we're going to call this, let's zoom in a little bit here so you can see it a little bit better. I am going to call this average cash left and quarter one. Okay, so we have this all set up and maybe we want to add some nice styling to that. That's a good one. Okay, so what are we going to do inside of here? Well, what we want is we want this cash value over here in average cash uh, left. So where exactly is that? Well, that is in, in cell G23. To target it and to bring it over here, what we can just simply do is reference that worksheet. So what's that worksheet called? It's called budget. So we're going to say equal to budget, and then we're going to put an exclamation mark and G23. Boom and we're able to get that value. And as that value changes over inside of budget, it's automatically going to show up inside of this area. Now, if you had a uh, worksheet that had a name, so let's say this was called budget one, what you would do instead 
is say equal to, and then you would put quotes around it. So you would say budget one like that. And then again, you would say exclamation mark and G 23. And you could put the quotes around just simply budget, but I just wanted to make you aware that if there is a space, you need to put quotes around it. Okay, so we have that set up and that's useful. But what would happen if we would like to come in here and actually be able to see this value over on this worksheet and how it changes while we are actually working with this worksheet? You know, is that something that's possible? Actually, it is. How would we be able to do that? Just go into quarterly budget, select this value that we have right inside of here. Then you're going to want to go into formulas and then you're going to go into watch window this guy right up here. Okay. So you go into watch window and you click on it. And over here, you're going to say that you want to add a watch for this. So add, that's good. And then we can come over into our other worksheet inside of our budget that we have right here. Click on this. And we're going to be able to see that value right here show up. And, and basically anywhere. And you can actually put multiple different um, values in your watch window and look how all of them change as you make changes. All right. So pretty cool stuff. Let's come in here and you can also come in and delete watches just like this and delete watch. Okay. So an um, interesting way for you to be able to track values in multiple different worksheets, no matter what worksheet you might be working on. Now, whenever it comes to protecting your worksheet, which is going to be extremely important, for example, we want our formulas to stay fixed. We have absolutely no reason for uh, us to want users to go in and start messing with our formulas. However, if we have templates set up, we most definitely would want them to be able to come in and say change dates or come in and change these values, these changing expense values. Now, what's kind of weird about Excel is that by default, it assumes, let's first off, let's go to review. It assumes, if we go to review, if the user clicks on protect sheet, like you can see right here, that it will protect every single thing and lock down the entire worksheet. That is normally what we don't want to do. Protect workbook, what it's going to do is basically protect the whole workbook. That means no moving, no editing, or deleting of sheets at all. So that's the difference between protect sheet. Protect sheet is going to work with a specific sheet in your workbook, while protect workbook is basically going to protect the overall structure of your workbook. So like I said, everything by default, however, when you click on protect sheet is going to be locked down. So what you have to do instead is say what you don't want to be protected. So we have to think here, all right? These are values that we would like our user to be able to change. Actually, not total. Total is a formula, so not that, but these. And then I just held down uh, the shift, or actually, I just clicked like this and just held that without holding down any keys. But then I want to uh, select everything else that I want the user to be able to change. So I want them to be able to change these. I am going and, whoops, I marched up. You want to hold down the control key. So, and the, the control key is going to allow you to select all of these additional parts that you want the user to be able to change. So these are the things they can change. And let's come in and do this. Maybe we'd want to do dates also. We don't want them to allow them to be able to change dates. Um, for now, I'm not going to do that. Okay, you could, of course. Now, taxes, these are all formulas. Do we want them to change any of those? Absolutely not. Cash left, all formulas. Average cash left, formulas. All these formulas. We do not want them to change any of these things, so we will not highlight them. However, we have selected everything that we want them to be able to highlight. And so what we want to be able to do now is if we want to lock down everything except those things, we're going to go into Home, come down to the More next to the font, click on that. And then we're going to go into protection. And very simply, if we do not want them to be locked down whenever we lock down the sheet, we uncheck locked. Okay. So uncheck it and click on OK. And now if they go into review, 
and protect worksheet, everything will be locked down except those uh, spaces that we have here that are currently highlighted. All right, so I'm not going to lock it down though right at the moment. Oh, and second thought, you know what? Do it. I don't want to see let you see what happens. Okay, so if we click on it, it's going to pop this up, and what it's going to do is it's going to have a check mark everywhere um, where users can perform certain actions. And then once again, anything that's unchecked are going to be the things they can't do. So what they're going to be able to do is select locked cells and select unlocked cells. However, they're not going to be able to format any cell that isn't already unlocked or, or uh, insert or delete or sort or do any of those things. Maybe we would want them to be able to sort. In this situation with the layout we have here, we most definitely would not. But that's basically it. So if there's a check in it, they can do those things. They can select those items. However, they can in absolutely no way go and uncheck those items. So let's just come in here. And to set this up, you just simply come in and type in some sort of password. I'm going to say A, B, C, D, E, F, G. All right. Very, very secure password. Click on OK. And there we go. And A, B, C, D, E, F, G and da, da 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 click on OK. All right, and then we can go in here again and select it again, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Why didn't I just type in A, B, C? And there we go like that. All right, so that is how we can come in here and edit and, and at the same time protect our worksheets. So up next, you might say to yourself, well, how do I unprotect it? Maybe that's really irritating. I decided I don't want to do it. Well, what you can do, is just go into file and then you go into info and then you can see right here where we have our different protections set up so we just click on protect and you can see right here where we have always open read only encrypt with password maybe you can't let me zoom in on that ah there's just no way to do it um i don't believe so let's see let's try it again nope it won't allow me to do it so hopefully you can see this full screen but basically it says Always open, but it will be read only. Encrypt with password. Protect current sheet. And that says control what types of changes people can make to the current sheet. Protect workbook structure. That's the same as what we had talked about before. Whenever the user clicks on protect whole workbook, add a digital signature. Mark as final. And if it's marked as final, this lets readers know the document is indeed final. Okay. And we can come in here. And we can look at this workbook again, EFG, right like this, and click on OK. And it is once again going A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and there we go. All right, so that's how we're able to go in and mess around with those different options. And then once again, if we would want to protect the entire workbook, we could go into Info. Here we are. We have this all set up, and we could click on unprotect and unprotect B, C, D, E, F, G, like this click on OK and there we turned off our, uh, our our protection on our worksheet all right so pretty neat stuff and indeed you can see that we can change this let's go into our federal taxes and let's just change this to uh, 09 or something like that and you can see that it, it allowed us to change previously if this was protected, it would not allow us to do that. Okay, so cool stuff. And what we're going to do now is dive into some of Excel's different what if tools, which are kind of fun. All right, so now I want to talk about what if scenarios. But first, I want to cover something I actually should have covered in the past, which is correcting errors. Let's go and create an error on purpose. So let's come in here, and this is just supposed to sum all these different values. But it is in the M31. Let's say if I put M31 inside of here, okay, and we calculate it, it gives me an error. Um, let's go and zoom in on this. It says there are one or more circular references where a formula refers to its own cell, either directly or indirectly. Now, we just made this change, so we know that we caused that error. But let's just say that we say, OK, and we just ignore it. All right. And then we also don't notice that this doesn't have a value and we just move on with our life. Very common, commonly done. Well, 
so we one thing that would be important to do is as we are creating our worksheets and performing our calculations is to make sure we don't have any errors. One thing we can do is we can go up to our formulas tab right here and then go over to error checking. And inside of error checking, just click on that and we can come down here where it says circular references and it's going to show us exactly where that is. Let's see if I can zoom in on it and it shows me. It does not, sorry. But if you go error checking, circular references, boom, and it goes right here. It goes right to the error. We can come in and see that we are actually referencing the cell itself, change it to 30, and now all is right with the world. Now, if we go to error checking, it is not going to show any circular references. Okay? And we can go, the error check is complete for the entire sheet. We can also do an error check and across everything and check that there are no errors. All right? Probably should have covered that in the past, but with a tutorial this big, sometimes it's hard to structure things. All right. So now let's get into what I was talking about before, which is error checking. And let's zoom in here so we can see this real nice. All right. Well, first thing I want to cover is goal seek. Now, uh, a pretty good example for how we can use goal seek. Basically, um, what it allows you to do is it allows you to change a formula's output by changing a value in the formula. So, for example, you could set a target value for the formula and Goal Seeker will actually change other values to get you to it. One great way to think about this is let's say you have a loan and the loan term in months is going to be 180 days. Let's go and just fill in everything. We have an interest rate and we have a payment. Okay, so we have all of these things and let's go and highlight them so that they look a little nicer okay so we have these things let's increase that the loan amount that we have is let's say we take out a loan for a hundred thousand dollars and it's going to be over 180 months before we pay it off we are going to have some interest rate inside of here. I don't know what it is. Let's say it is 0.08%. And we have a payment that we're going to make every month. Now, what we're going to be able to do with Goal Seek is actually figure out what interest rate we would uh, need to be able to succeed with our ultimate goals. So what we're going to do is inside of payment, let's use the formulas and financial and payment. All right. And inside of here, what we're going to do is we are going to say our rate is this guy right here. Um, number of periods that is going to be this guy right here. And then we are going to have our overall loan amount which is going to be this guy, whoops, right here. All right. And then we have other different like future values and all this stuff, which we're not going to worry about. All right. So we're going to generate that formula for ourselves here. And that looks really wrong. You know why it looks really wrong is because um, for this guy, this is going to be the interest rate. This is going to be divided by 12 and everything else there I think is fine. All right, let's do that. Okay, so this looks more manageable, $955. And the reason why we're dividing that by 12 is because this is going to be an annual interest rate and not a monthly interest rate. We're not going to loan sharks here. Now what we want to do is we want to go into our goal seek and actually figure out what this interest rate right here would have to be if we wanted to pay, say, $900 a month instead of $955. So we're going to go into our data tab right here, and we're going to go over to where it says what if analysis. We're going to click on that, and then we're going to say goal seek. And this is what it looks like. All right, so what we're going to do here is we are going to put in B4, which is going to be our... Um, what we're looking at. So let's go before. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to say that we want our value. And in this circumstance, it's going to be a payment. So it's going to be negative 900. And what we want to change is this cell, which is the interest rate. And it's going to go in and figure out what that interest rate is based off of um, us only paying $900 a month versus paying 955 And we click on OK. It's going to go and get that precise interest rate. So this is what we would have to negotiate with the bank if we wanted to pay off that loan in this specific term period and we only wanted to pay $900 a month or we could only afford $900 a month. All right? So pretty cool example of how we can use that. Let's do another example because this is kind of fun. Let's say that we want to find out how we can be a millionaire. So we're going to take our monthly investment and we are going to go and define our annual rate that we expect to receive for our investment. Years to invest. Um, let's go and get our future investment value, which we're going to say we want to be $1 million. And let's also say that we want information on the total amount invested, you know, amount, amount of money we put in versus the interest earned because we want to see how much money we made in interest. So our monthly investment, let's... Uh, Let's throw something inside of here. I don't know, $1,500. And let's say that we are expecting to make an 8% return. Years to invest. Let's say we have 20 years to become a millionaire. Now what we can do down in the future investment value area is we're going to go into formulas and we're going to go into financials. And we're going to come in here where we can calculate a future value. All right, and you can see all the different parts here. We have a rate and periods and payments. So inside of the rate area, what we're going to say is we are going to use B and 7. Okay, so there's B7. And with B7, remember, we're going to divide this by 12 because this is we're working on a monthly investment versus an annual investment. Once again, for our period, we're going to use B8. So this is years to invest. But this is years, and this, this formula is expecting us to be working with years and we are going, or we, months. So we are going to say times 12. And then for our, our payment amount, we're going to actually say negative and B6. So we're going to invest $1,500 into said investment, whatever it is. All right, and we click on OK. And you can see, ah, we didn't reach our goals. So how much are we going to have to increase our monthly investment to become a millionaire in 20 years? OK, is it even possible? Well, we're going to use our same tool we had before. So we're going to say data once again, what if analysis, and we're going to say that we want to go with goal seek to figure out how much we have to actually invest. So inside of this, we're going to be changing B9. So there, this is, we want this to be $1 million. And we're going to set this to one and one, two, three, one, two, three. So that's $1 million. And what exactly do we want to change to be able to get there? Well, in this situation, this is going to be the monthly investment amount. So it's going to be B6. Let me zoom in there so you can see. All right, so that's what we're working with here. B9 is set the cell, which is going to be our future amount, which we want to be $1 million, And we're going to do it by changing our monthly investment. Now, we could also do it by changing our annual rate of return. Um, but in this circumstance, we're not going to do that, okay? Um, well, what did I do? Okay. I think it's okay now. Yes. So we can say... OK. And is it working? And you can see that it went and made our calculations, our target values and so forth and so on. And we can say OK. 
and this is now 1 million and it's telling us that we have to invest roughly $1700 with this point 8 or this 8% return to be able to come in and get our uh, $1 million goal. All right, so pretty cool stuff. Now, if we wanna find out what our total investment amount, the amount of money we put in, we could just come in and say something like B8 times 12, and then multiply that times B6. And that is how much money we put in. Not bad for getting a million dollars. And then we can just quite simply just come in and say this, minus this, and you can see how much money we were able to earn in interest over a 20 year period. And that is the power of investing. All right, so cool stuff. Taught you how to be a millionaire, taught you how to pay off your loans, so really awesome. Now I wanna talk about data tables. All right, so a data table is going to be differ in that with a data table, you can actually change values in some of the cells and come up with different answers to a problem. And there are single as well as multivariable data tables that are available to you. And with this example, I think it's going to make sense. So what I want to do here is I want to see the difference we can expect from our or with our investments if we receive different investment returns. So let's just come down here. And uh, what do we want to do? Well, let's say we want to say, hmm, monthly investment and let's say expected return and uh, years to invest. All right. And then underneath that, we're going to say expected return. And then we're going to throw a whole bunch of different returns. So we're going to say 5% and 6% and 7%. 8%, 9%, and 10%. All right. So those are the different amounts that we'll be working with. And I don't like the way this is set up. Let's do that. And let's go and center this. Okay. So here we are. And we're going to make our different calculations here. Maybe I'm going to go move these down just so I can separate them from the other stuff here because we have similar information. So let's paste this down here just so I can zoom in. All right, so we have our monthly investment. How much are we investing? Well, we're gonna stick to our guns and just say $1,500. Maybe we wanna take a look at exactly um, how much we can earn depending upon interest rates now. Like before, we were saying, okay, how much do we have to increase our monthly investment? Maybe this time we wanna take a look at, well, if we get take riskier investments that provide a potential higher return, how, how much money are we going to earn in those situations? So years to invest, uh, let's stick with 20, just like we did previously. All right, so now what I want to do is I'm going to go into my expected return area, and I'm going to go formulas, financial, and FV, once again, rate is going to be um, B24. We already defined that. That's this guy right here. Very important to divide that by 12 and over a certain period of time, we're going to say B25. And this, of course, is going to be multiplied times 12. And then we will have our investment amount, which is going to be this guy right here, except we are going to make it negative. Okay, so here is let's go and zoom in here so you can see this a little bit better. Okay, so. That is how we are matching up our rate, our period of time, and our payment amounts. All right, so we got all those calculated and we hit okay. All right, so there we have our amount. Now what's really cool here is we can come in and select, selected return with all, whoops, did I not get them all? All right, let's come down here. There, we have all those selected. And now what we can do is go into data and then we can say that we want to go and click on what if analysis, just like we did previously. And then we're going to say data table. And inside of the data table, we can do both row input as well as column input. But I am only, that would be multivariable if you do row and column. 
In this situation, I am just going to do column. And I'm going to say that this is going to be A28 through the uh, A33. So it's going to use all of those different changings, changes in percentages. And it's going to go and give me my expected return. All right, and I just click on OK. Whoops, what did I do wrong here in this situation? Oh, I see, I got myself backwards. What I want to do is actually place it in this, this area right here. So let's just come in here like that and highlight this. And then what it's going to do is take these values, place them in there, and then generate all the calculations right here. Boom, and it did it. So we can see right here, if we want to be a millionaire and we only want to invest $1,500 a month over a 20-year period, well, then we're going to need at least a 9% return instead of an 8% return. Now I'm going to show you something that blew my mind whenever I first saw it a while back, and it is called the solver. Now it is an add-in just like we had before. So you're going to have to go to file and you're going to have to go over and of course click down here where you see options. And then this guy's going to pop up once again. Now what we're going to need to do is come down here where it says Excel add-ins and click on OK. Of course, you have to click on add-ins over here on the left side. And solver is right here. It's solver add-in is what you want to look, look for. And you're going to want to put check marks in all of those and then click on OK. And then if you do that, if you go to your data tab over here on the right side of the screen, you're going to see solver show up. So there's solver. All right, and wait until you can you see what we can do with Solver. Very cool. All right, so we've been working with a common scenario in which we are basically running a store that sells computers. All right, and what we want to do here is we want to figure out, let's say that we have a limited amount of money for inventory. On top of that, we have a limited amount of space to hold said inventory. So knowing this, and knowing the profit each of those items is going to provide, and knowing the amount of space each of those items is going to take up, can we have Excel tell us exactly what products we should buy and how many of them? Yes, we can with the solver. Now, this is really cool. So let's say we have a per unit profit. And on top of that, let's say that this is going to be desktops. So we have desktop computers, we have laptop computers, and we have tablets. And we're going to figure out which ones we should have and in our inventory to maximize our overall profits. Now we're going to have um, current usage amount, which is going to be a, a uh, cost as well as a storage. And then on top of that, we're going to have current available. So current availability. So that's going to be like, how much space do we have and how much cash do we have to be able to make certain purchases? And go over to home and let's style this up a little bit. And let's format and auto size. All right, looking better. All right, so let's continue here. Let's say that we have a cost amount and a storage amount that is known for our desktops and our laptops. So let's say that the cost for a desktop is $900 and $800 for a laptop and $250 for a tablet. This is going to be a calculation. We're going to say this is we have $100,000 to work with, and we have 150 unit sizes of space in our uh, warehouse. Let's say that a desktop takes up 1.75% of a unit of space in our warehouse. Let's say a laptop takes up one, and we'll say a tablet takes up 0.55. So it's like the size of the box. Okay, what else can we do here? Well, down here, we're going to do the same thing. So we're going to say desktop, laptop, tablet. Let's just copy those guys and paste those in there. And then we're going to have a total profit. 
So we'll say total profit is what we are aiming to maximize by allocating resources. And uh, that and format painter and boom. Okay, so we have all those set up. So what are we going to calculate? Well, units to order is what we are looking to be able to have Excel calculate for us. So this is really cool. Okay, so we have our total profit. We have all this. Well, to make this, a, oh, I, I forgot to put our profit amount in. Let's say our profit amount for every desktop we sell is $325. Of course, this is all sort of made up. So um, tablets, $95, but nothing changes. Real world data, you're still going to get the same awesome results. So what I want to do is I want to name these. We've talked about naming in the past because it's going to make our calculations a little bit easier to work with. So I'm going to highlight our profits here and I'm going to come up here and I'm going to say per unit profit like that. So those are going to be called per unit profit. And then I'd also like to come in and um, hmm, what else should I name these guys? Well, I think this right here is going to have a name which is going to be current usage. So this is going to actually be um, how much, our total usage amount, which is going to be a goal of maximizing these, these two things right here. It's actually our goal is to maximize profits. But that is what is going to be calculated. I'm going to calculate it here in a second. Just give me a moment. And this is going to be current available. And this is going to represent how much money we have right now before we make a single purchase and how much space we have in our warehouse before we make any purchases. Then on top of that, I'm going to come into the units to order area, select that, and I'm going to call this units to order. And there that is. Okay. And then let's also make another, let's name this and let's just call it tote profit like that. All right, so we have all those. Now what we need to do is go into our current usage area, and this is actually going to be a formula that we're going to have to calculate. And we're going to use some product for this. So what we're going to do here is we are going to use some product. And what it is going to do is it is going to go and take all of these costs for the different items and then compare them to the number of products we purchased to give us a final value. All right, so let's say we bought uh, two desktop computers. It's going to take that two, multiply it times the nine. Then we bought 10 laptops. It's going to take the 10 times the 800 and one tablet. It's going to multiply one times 250, and then it's going to sum all of those. So that's, that's basically the way some product works. All right, so we're going to go formulas. And we're going to go math and trig, and we're going to look for some product right here. And for some product, what did I say we're going to do? We are going to go and get B16 through D. That's the very first we're going to take, which is going to be how much do they cost? And then for our second array of values, we're going to say how many items did we order? Yes, I know we don't know how many. We're going to allow... Excel and the solver add-in to go and figure that out to maximize profit. That's what's cool about it. Okay, so let's click on OK. All right, it said currently says zero because these are all zeroed out. Then we're going to go down to the storage. And we also have to figure out, well, um, what is going to be the sum of, of the storage based off of these purchases? Again, solver automatically does this for us. But we're going to have to use some product again. So math and trig, some product. This time for this array, what are we going to be using? We're going to be using how much storage space each of them takes up. And then what are we going to be using for the second part? Totally depends on how many products we order once again. And click on OK once again. Now what's really cool here is we have all those set up. We're going to go into data this time. And we're going to click on Solver. And what are we going to say to Solver? Well, 
are we want to set an objective and that objective is to maximize total profit so we're going to put total profit at the top and then we're going to select max so let's come in and i'm going to go and put total profit tote profit and i'll zoom in here so you can see it we want to maximize it and what are we going to be changing to maximize it we're going to change the units to order that's the reason why we gave that a name so um this is called units to order i believe <laughs> if i didn't tell you i think that's what i called it so units to order which is going to be these values these are going to be the value solver is going to change to maximize total profit now what what we're going to do now is we need to add certain constraints and one of those constraints is that our current usage amount whoops make sure i spell usage amount is going to be less than our current available amount so these are this is called current usage these two and these are called current available so we're saying here that in calculating this we have to also not spend more than $100 and also not take up more than 150 units worth of space. All right. So we'll go and add that in there. Click on OK. Whoops. I shouldn't have hit that. I should have hit OK. So let's just go in again and just say current usage less than or equal to. And this is going to be current available. And click on OK, not add. OK. All right. Whoops. Oh, I guess it did put it in there. Well, let's just delete one of them. All right. So now we just have one. And this is what it looks like. So we're maximizing total profit. How are we going to do it? By changing the values in the three cells that are labeled units to order. And we want to make sure we do not spend more than $100 or take up more than 150 units of space. All right. And on top of that, we also are going to come in here and change this to simple LP. And we are also going to come in and uh, check make unconstrained variables non-negative. And then we just come in and click on solve, right like this. Object cell contents must be a formula. What? What is wrong with this? Let's click on OK, figure out what I did wrong. Oh, I know what I did. I forgot to go into total profit. And this is going to be a sum product also. So formula, math, sum product, sum product. And our first array in this situation is going to be per unit profit. So let's just type in per unit profit like that. And then the second part is going to be units to order. I like that. So if we zoom in, those two. Okay. Forgot to put that into the profit area. So what it's doing is per unit profit, it's going to take these three different parts up here and also multiply them, sum them to the units to order. Forgot to do that. Sorry about that. Okay. So we'll say okay. And let's see if the solver still has our information inside of it. Solver. And it does super awesome. So total profit, max them out by changing the units to order and just don't spend more than $100,000 or take up more than 150 spaces. Click on solve. And hey, it's working. And it also calculated it. And that sounds good. And we'll, we'll click on OK. And it went in and figured out that I need to maximize profit. I need to buy 40, lap, or 40 desktops. 80 laptops and zero tablets. And in doing so, I spend the $100,000 to make a $29,000 profit after. So I'm, you know, I'm making $129,000 and it's taking up the precise amount of space. So really awesome. And that is an example of how you can use Solver. Now, for our last example, what I'd like to do is talk about scenarios. Oh, the last example in regards to working with these uh, what if um, tools that we have available to us or these data tools. I guess I'm using the solver also. Okay, so let's come in. Let's just call this scenarios. And uh, basically with a scenario, what you can do is you can create multiple sets of values and then switch between them 
to view the different results. So what I want to do here is I want to create a best case scenario for uh, revenue versus cost of goods sold to figure out gross profit. And I'm going to put in a best case scenario and I am going to put in a worst case scenario. Let's just come in and style this slightly just so it stands out. All right, scenarios. So we're going to say that we have a gross revenue amount and cost of good goods sold. And then we're going to have a gross profit. Okay, so we're going to start off here and we'll throw some a value in there. Let's say our worst case scenario is $50,000 and a, whoops, uh, $13,200 in regards to cost of goods sold. And then this is just going to end up being equal to this value right here. Um, whoops, uh, yeah, yeah, this value right here minus this value right here. All right, boom, there we go. We have our first example. Now we wanna go and we actually want to add this scenario. So we're going to go into our data section that we have right here. And then we're gonna go into what if analysis and scenario manager. We'll click on add. And our scenario here is going to be worst case and our changing cells are going to be B, what is it, 37 and 38. So B, 37, B, 38. And then you can put in inf information inside of here. And I'm also going to put a check. Let's see here. Uh, whoops, hit the wrong button. Let's also go and put prevent changes. And what that does is that just prevents editing the scenario whenever the worksheet is protected. So, you know, that's all. We already covered protections and things like that. So this is our worst case scenario. We'll click on OK. And then what we're going to do is we are going to click on Add. And we're going to put in another. So let's say our best case scenario. Best case. And we will have 37 and uh, 38 again. And then in this situation, we're going to hit OK, and it's going to allow us to change it. So we can put in, say, 150,000, and this is going to be our best case scenario, and 26,000. Whoops, 26,000. Let's zoom in here. So you can see I'm now entering the values for thirty-seven B37 and B38 under our best case scenario. OK, click on that. Click on OK. And you can see here we have both our worst case and our best case listed both at the same time. Maybe we'll, we, we also want another one. So we can, I just clicked add again, and let's say uh, mid case scenario, B37 and 38, click on okay, and it's gonna say enter those values. So for our mid case, let's say we have, I don't know, 100,000 and uh, uh, 2,500, okay? So I went and put in some more values, okay? So you can see those as well. Now in this situation, again, click on OK, not add, click on OK. And there you go, you have all those set up. Now what's really neat about this is I can go and click on these different cases. So I have worst case set up here right now. I can click on show and it's gonna show worst case. I can click on best case, show, and it's gonna show best case. Mid case, show, and it's gonna show those as well. And then if I wanna see all of the different scenarios all at once, I click on summary scenario summary. We can also create it as a pivot table if we'd want. Let's just create it as a summary. Click on OK and it's going to create a new worksheet and you can see there is our worksheet with an overview of all the different scenarios that are possible based off of the data that I placed inside of there. All right, so cool stuff. whole bunch of different cool little tricks we can use with our data tabs in What If and the Solver. And now I want to talk about macros. All right, so we've come pretty long way and we are gonna finish up here by talking about macros. So basically, to start off, we need to get the ability to create macros. So you can just click on any of the tabs in the top of you know, your Excel application and then go to Customize the Ribbon. And whenever you do, you are going to see an option here 
developer and there is no check in it. You are going to put a check in it and click on OK and then guess what? Now you have a developer tab and you can create macros. So why would you want to create a macro? Well basically they allow you to perform common operations through automation and there's an extension to ba the basic concept of macros which is VBA programming. Now VBA programming also can make it very easy to automate repetitive tasks but yeah I think you're going to find most of the time that macros are going to allow you to do everything you want to know. The main benefit to understanding VBA is that you are going it's visual basic for applications is what it stands for and basically what it it's going to be beneficial to understand VBA so that you can go in and edit macros but for the most part you can use just basic macros versus hardcore programming in case you need to do really crazy things like looping structures and um, doing things that are very very dynamic and as you're going to see here, I'm going to show you an example of how we can create a macro, edit a macro, and then, of course, run a macro. So the very first thing that we're going to want to do here is we are going to want to create a macro. So what I want to do is I am going to create or open a sheet here, and I am going to call it customers, customers, like that. And I'm going to go get some information. And let's say that you very often receive customer information and you want to automate the process of styling and working with that, that information so that you can just click a button and it automatically just fixes everything and this mess goes away. Well, macro is great for that. So what we want to do first is we want to come up here where it says record macro. All right, and I'm going to click on record macro and I have to give it a name. So I'm going to call it fix customer. All right, and then you can make a shortcut key for it, but I would watch out for that because it is possible to overwrite system shortcuts. So I do not advise you to create a shortcut for it because that will probably cause more problems than it is worth. You can also put a description inside of here. So I could say something like this macro performs uh, common fixes to new customer worksheets. Okay, so there is a description. So you're going to name your macro. You're probably not going to put a shortcut key in there. You're going to save it to this workbook and you're going to put a description of exactly what it does and then you are going to click on OK. All right, so it is currently recording. So what you want to do right now is you want to go through the process of what exactly do you do whenever you clean up this, uh, this data that's thrown inside here that you see all the time. Well, one thing we might want to do is to add a header section to it. So we're just going to come in here and we're it's basically it's recording every single thing you do right now. So we're going to go control shift and plus and we're going to create a header section and it's actually writing the code in the background as we are doing all of this. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go in and add in ID and then we could say something like first name last name don't worry about anything else this is going to be company this is going to be email and if you make an error in spelling don't worry about it i'll show you how to fix that phone number this is uh, our first sale this is position position um this is going to be street this is going to be city this is going to be state and it's recording all this as we do it and zip code. Okay. So we put all that in there. Now what we're going to do is we're going to style the header. So I'm going to select everything here, go into home and I'm going to say that I want to use my date style that I have been using here. Maybe I want to come in here and uh, do like a select all on this. Whoops. Select all on this. 
and then maybe I want to format it so that it, it automatically adjusts the width that we have inside of there. That's good. We can also come in and make changes to the date. Like maybe we don't like this date. So we can come in here and change, you know, whatever that date type is. So we can come in here and say that we want to change our format and it has date down inside of here. And maybe we want to pick this one. I don't know. Just simply just doing stuff here. Okay. So I'm going to do that instead. Change the dates. What else could we want to do? We could uh, go and make this centered. So we could highlight this position area right here and center that information. We could, um, I don't know, a lot of the other stuff looks good. In the actual VBA code, I'm gonna show you how to add filtering. We can auto adjust like this. We could come in and say, hey, I want this to be centered also. Doesn't really matter. You could just make it look like whatever you want it to look like. Just be as tedious as you want to be. I personally think that this looks pretty good. So what I'm going to do at this point in time is I'm going to go back to developer and I'm going to click on stop recording. Okay. And it is in there. Okay. So now the part, the whole thing is, let's say you went through all this, you did all that work. You like the way this looks. However, you want there to be filters on this and there's no filters. And you're like, ah, I have to redo all that. No, you don't. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to edit the macro and how you can do that is you can just go and click on visual basic right like this and you go into your modules. Well, let's see here. This is modules right here and we can say module one. This is for our specific. I have multiple different sheets here open. So I have book two. This is Excel tutorial two modules module one is where your macro lives so we're just going to double click on that module and you're going to see that it has all of the code right here for you to peruse so what does it mean well this is creating a subroutine called fix customer and there's some information there on exactly what this function is going to do for us and what is basically going on if you look at rows uh, one colon one, what that is simply saying is select the first row. That's it. And then it's saying cut copy mode, set to false. What that means is it wants to get rid of the uh, clear the clipboard. That's what that means. Um, then it's just basically a whole bunch of selections. So you select a row or you select an individual cell and you then make a change to it. The selection insert shift down, what that is saying is that it wants you to take the selection, which was the rows one colon one, which is the first row, and shift it down one row. That's what insert shift XL down means. Then we have range A1. That means select cell A1. And formula R1C1 means put the value ID inside of it. It then does that for all of the other different uh, individual cells. Remember, we did our header changes. If you can see here underneath zip, there's a part where it says range A1 colon L1. What that means is select those cells, which is going to be our header, and then change their styling to date style. That's what that means. You can see here we are doing an auto fit that is just basically separating all the columns so they're an equal width apart. Uh, range G2 through G27, that's selecting all the dates. And number format is taking the selection, which is all the dates. That's what selection is. And it is changing the format on those dates. This really long thing where it says with selection, all that is doing, the only part of that that is changing is actually centering the position for the customer that they have, if you're wondering. So it looks really complicated, but it's really not all that complicated. And uh, everything else here. Oh, you can see where it has columns H colon H. What that is doing is manually, very precisely, changing the width of that column to exactly 11.45. And then in the G column at the very, very end, you can see that I'm also changing that column width to 10.91, all right? There you go. You can read VBA code because that's a lot of what VBA code 
is. Now, there's a uh, member I said that I wanted to come in here and manually change this. I wish I could change the font. Can I? What? I, I, I'm, I never do this in real life. So um, let's see here if I can figure out how to change the font inside of here. And yes, indeed. So let's go into tools and options and editor tab width. Nope. Editor format. There we go. Font size. So maybe I can adjust this to a level that you can actually see what I'm doing. So I just went and changed it to 18. And look at that. It's still black on white text, so it's hard, kind of hard to read. Hopefully you can see it. Maybe I'll make it bigger yet just so that you can see this. Uh, all right. Editor format. And let's make it 24. Okay. That's pretty big. Did it change at all? Didn't look like it to me. Let's go tools. <laughs> this is the very end of the tutorial. So I'm starting to be, ah, uh, it did not change it. 24. There we go. Click on okay. And it refuses to change it. So we just discovered it doesn't like changing that. Okay. So what I want to do here is add the filtering in and I want to put it on the very first row. So where am I going to, to put this in here? Now this is precisely changing that. And uh, this member, this is the range, that's a selection, and this is making the change to that selection. So here was a range, a selection, and it changes the date. I'm going to put it in here. I don't know that it's going to be perfect, but we'll do our best. So we know from looking up here, rows, colon, one, and uh, the select part, or maybe we could just put it, we could put it after we put in all of this information. And then every, all the other styling width-wise should work out good. Let's try that. So this allows us to select our first row. And so what we're going to do right here where it changes the date format right after that, I think it's going to be a good place for me to throw in my changes. So I'll zoom in on this after I'm done coding it so that you can see. So that's going to select that. And then what I want to do afterwards is um, let's do uh, to insert our filter. What we're going to have to do is say selection dot auto filter like that. And then on top of that, let's throw an auto fit inside of it. So I'm going to say range and from column A1 through column uh, L27, so the whole entire thing, L27, I want to go and select that. So I'm going to say dot select. And then what I want to do on that is do an auto fit. So that's going to take all of the columns on the entire worksheet after I add in the filter and it's selection, not selections, and it's going to auto fit the columns. So I'm hoping that this is going to allow me to add filters and not mess up anything else. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping. So we'll say columns and auto fit. And this is probably going to give me an error whenever I save this. That's okay. So I'm going to click on uh, control save. Yes, it did. Yeah, whoops. I told you that I was going to, ah, what'd you just do? Well, what it, what it was saying, sorry about that, but what it was saying is I am not allowed to save that as a workbook or save that uh, macro in the workbook unless I change the file type to Excel macro enabled workbook. So I have to save it as an Excel macro enabled workbook. Otherwise, it won't allow me to do it. It's pretty mean. So I'm going to click save on that, and now I will be able to save it. So I made those changes and what I was, whenever I went crazy there for a second, um, <laughs> I wanted to show you the code large. All right. So what our custom code that we entered says, I want to select row one and I want you to add a filtering option on each column in row one. And then I want you to select the whole worksheet from A1 the whole way to L27. That's the whole thing. And then I want you to auto fit all the columns so that everything fits. So that's what all of our code does. Pretty neat stuff. And uh, if I didn't save it, now I'm going to save it. And so Control S, and I can just close that. 
All right, so I have customers on here, but this is not what I want. I want this to be messed up. So I am going to come in and I'm going to delete everything here. So I'm going to delete it and then I'm going to go into home and set everything to normal. And then I'm going to go get a messier version of that. So I'm going to go like this and I'm going to paste it in there. Okay, so here it is, no headers, the dates messed up and all of that. So I went through all the effort of creating that macro. Now, how do I actually come in and run it? And better yet, how do I create a button that I can just press and it's gonna automatically create it for me? Well, I'm gonna go into developer and I'm gonna go into insert. And then there's like a thing that looks like a button underneath of form controls. There's a whole bunch of form controls that are available to you. Um, I'm gonna click on this one. I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna drag, and don't worry, we can move the button. And I'm gonna say that I want the button to be right here. I made it really, really big. So what am I gonna call this? Um, let's call it fix customers. How about that? So fix customers and it had no spaces. Can't put any, any spaces inside of this name. And let's see if I can zoom in. See, fix customers. That's all it is like that. And then I go, okay. And that is it. And there's my button. All right. So now what I can do is I can come in here and I can change the name of it. Uh, let's see if I can, there you go. So I can say, fix customers, just like that. And now it has a name and better yet, it has a button. And if you want to move it somewhere else, you just right click it and move it. Let's say you want to move it over here. Well, you can just move it over there and it'll say move here and then move here. All right. And then if I click this, I'm going to click off of it first and then I'm going to click fix customers. And it says I can't run the macro. The macro may not be, be available in this workbook. What are you talking about? I just created it. Well, let me figure out what's going on here and then you'll find a fix to another weird thing. Now I know what I did. I went in here and changed this macro name. That's not what I wanted to do. I just want to select to fix customer. All right, been making this tutorial for many, many, many hours. So just select fix customer, okay? And click on okay. And there you have your button. And let's just come in here and say fix customers, change its name, customers, like that click off of it and then click it. And it's automatically going to go in there and do all that work for you. 100% automated. So pretty cool stuff. All right. So there you go, guys. That is, this is literally hours upon hours of Excel. I don't even know how many hours this is. Many hours. I covered every single thing that I could possibly imagine to cover with Excel. I was considering going and teaching um, VBA and actually programming everything. I went over it a little bit, but it, 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 that would be another couple hours. If you guys really want it, tell me in the context or con comment section below, and I'll be happy to do it. Um, so hopefully you found this tutorial useful. And like always, please leave your questions and comments down below. Otherwise, till next time.